Christmas Meeting by Rosemary Timperley I have never spent Christmas alone before. It gives me an uncanny feeling, sitting alone in my furnished room, with my head full of ghosts, and the room full of voices of the past. It's a drowning feeling, all the Christmases of the past coming back in a mud jumble, the childish Christmas with a house full of relations, a tree in the window, sixpences in the pudding and the delicious crinkly stocking in the dark morning, the adolescent Christmas with mother and father, the war and the bitter cold, and the letters from abroad, the first really grown-up Christmas with a lover, the snow and the enchantment, red wine and kisses, and the walk in the dark before midnight, with the ground so white and the stars diamond bright in the black sky, so many Christmases through the year, and now, the first Christmas alone. But not quite loneliness. A feeling of companionship with all the other people who are spending Christmas alone, millions of them, past and present. A feeling that if I close my eyes, there will be no past or future, only an endless present which is time, because it is all we ever have. Yes, however cynical you are, however irreligious, it makes you feel queer to be alone at Christmas time. So, I am absurdly relieved when the young man walks in. There's nothing romantic about it. I'm a woman of nearly fifty, a spinster schoolmarm with grim, dark hair and myopic eyes that once were beautiful. And he's a kid of twenty, rather unconventionally dressed with a flowing wine-coloured tie and a black velvet jacket and brown curls which could do with the taste of the barber's scissors. The effeminacy of his dress is belied by his features, narrow, piercing blue eyes and arrogant, jutting nose and chin. Not that he looks strong. The skin is fine, drawn over the prominent features, and he is very white. He bursts in without knocking, then pauses, says, I'm so sorry, I thought this was my room. He begins to go out, then hesitates and says, Are you alone? Yes. It's queer being alone at Christmas, isn't it? May I stay and talk? I'd be glad if you would. He comes right in and sits down by the fire. I hope you don't think I came here on purpose. I, I really did think it was my room, he explains. I'm glad you made the mistake. But you're a very young person to be alone at Christmas time. I wouldn't go back to the country to my family. It would hold up my work. I'm a writer. I see. I can't help smiling a little. That explains his rather unusual dress, and he takes himself so seriously, this young man. Of course, you mustn't waste a precious moment of writing, I say with a twinkle. No, not a moment. That's what my family won't see. They don't appreciate urgency. Families are never appreciative of the artistic nature. No, they aren't, he agrees seriously. What are you writing? Poetry and a diary combined. It's called My Poems and I by Francis Randall. That's my name. My family say there's no point in my writing, that I'm too young. But I don't feel young. Sometimes... I feel like an old man with too much to do before he dies. Revolving faster and faster on the wheel of creativeness. Yes, yes, exactly. You understand. You must read my work sometime. Please read my work. Read my work. A note of desperation in his voice. A look of fear in his eyes makes me say, We're both getting much too solemn for Christmas Day. I'm going to make you some coffee. And I have a plum cake. I move about clattering cups, spooning coffee into my percolator, but I must have offended him, for when I look around, I find he has left me. I am absurdly disappointed. I finish making coffee, however, then turn to the bookshelf in my room. It's piled high with volumes, for which the landlady has apologised profusely. Hope you don't mind the books, miss, but my husband won't part with them, and there's nowhere else to put them. We charge a bit less for the room for that reason. I don't mind, I said. Books are good friends. But these aren't very friendly-looking books. I take one at random, or does some strange fate guide my hand? Sipping my coffee, inhaling my cigarette smoke, I begin to read the battered little book, published, I see, in spring, 1852. It's mainly poetry, immature stuff, but vivid. Then there's a kind of diary, more realistic, less affected. Out of curiosity, if there are any amusing comparisons, I turn to the entry for Christmas Day, 1851. I read, My first Christmas Day alone. I had rather an odd experience. When I went back to my lodgings after a walk, 
there was a middle-aged woman in my room. I thought at first I'd walked into the wrong room, but this was not so. And later, after a pleasant talk, she disappeared. I suppose she was a ghost, but I wasn't frightened. I liked her. But I don't feel well tonight, not at all well. I have never felt ill at Christmas before. A publisher's note followed the last entry. Francis Randall died from a sudden heart attack on the night of Christmas Day, 1851. The woman mentioned in this final entry in his diary was the last person to see him alive. In spite of a request for her, in spite of a request for her to come forward, she never did. Her identity remains a mystery. Christmas Eve on a Haunted Hulk by Frank Cowper. I shall never forget that night as long as I live. It was during the Christmas vacation of 1877. I was staying with an old college friend who had lately been appointed the curate of a country parish and had asked me to come and cheer him up since he could not get away at that time. As we drove along the straight country lane from the little wayside station, it forcibly struck me that life in such a place must be dreary indeed. I have always been much influenced by local colour. Above all things, I am depressed by a dead level, and here was monotony with a vengeance. On each side of the low hedges, lichen-covered and wind-cropped, stretched bare fields, the absolute level of the horizon being only broken at intervals by some mournful tree that pointed like a decrepit finger-post towards the east for all its western growth was nipped and blasted by the roaring southwest winds. An occasional black spot dotted against the grey distance marked a hayrick or labourer's cottage, while some two miles ahead of us the stunted spire of my friend's church stood out against the wintry sky amid the withered branches of a few ragged trees. On our right hand stretched dreary wastes of mud, interspersed here and there with firmer patches of land, but desolate and forlorn, cut off from all communication with the mainland by acres of mud and thin streaks of brown water. A few seabirds were piping over the waste, and this was the only sound, except the grit of our own wheels and the steady step of the horse, which broke the silence. Not lively, is it, said Jones, and I couldn't say it was. As we drove up street, as the inhabitants fondly called a small array of low houses which bordered the high road, I noticed the lacklustre expression of the few children and untidy women who were loitering about the doors of their houses. There was an old tumble-down inn with a dilapidated signboard, scarcely held up by its rickety ironwork. A daub of yellow and red paint with a dingy streak of blue was supposed to represent the Duke's head, although what exalted member of the aristocracy was thus distinguished, it would be hard to say. Jones inclined to think it was the Duke of Wellington, but I upheld the theory that it was the Duke of Marlborough, chiefly basing my arguments on the fact that no artist who desired to convey a striking likeness would fail to show the great Duke in profile, whereas this personage was evidently depicted full face and wearing a three-cornered hat. At the end of the village was the church, standing in an untidy churchyard, and opposite it was a neat little house, quite new, and of that utilitarian order of architecture which will stamp the Victorian age as one of the least imaginative of eras. Two windows flanked the front door, and three narrow windows looked out overhead from under a slate roof, variety and distinction being given to the facade by the brilliant blending of the yellow bricks with red, so bright as to suggest the idea of their having been painted. A scrupulously clean stone at the front door, together with the bright green of the little palings and woodwork, told me what sort of landlady to expect, and I was not disappointed. A kindly featured woman, thin, cheery and active, received us, speaking in that encouraging tone of half-compassionate, half-proprietary patronage, which I have observed so many women adopt towards lone beings of the opposite sex. You'll find it precious dull, old man, said Jones, as we were eating our frugal dinner. 
There's nothing for you to do unless you care to try a shot at the duck over the mud flats. I shall be busy on and off nearly all tomorrow. As we talked, I could not help admiring the cheerful pluck with which Jones endured the terrible monotony of his life in this dreary place. His rector was said to be delicate, and in order to prolong a life which no doubt he considered valuable to the church, he lived with his family either at Torquay or Cannes in elegant idleness, quite unable to do any duty, but fully equal to enjoying the pleasant society of those charming places, and quite satisfied that he had done his duty when he sacrificed a tenth of his income to provide for the spiritual needs of his parish. There was no squire in the place, no gentlefolk, as the rustics called them, lived nearer than five miles, and there was not a single being of his own class with whom poor Jones could associate, and yet he made no complaint. The nearest approach to one being the remark that the worst of it was, it was so difficult, if not impossible, to be really understood. The poor being so suspicious and ignorant, they look at everything from such a low standpoint. Enthusiasm and freshness sink so easily into formalism and listlessness. The next day, finding that I really could be of no use and feeling awkward and bored, as a man always is when another is actively doing his duty, I went off to the marshes to see if I could get any sport. I took some sandwiches and a flask with me, not intending to return until dinner. After wandering about for some time, crossing dyke after dyke by treacherous rails, more or less rotten, I found myself on the edge of a wide mere. I could see some duck out in the middle, and standing far out in the shallow water was a heron. They were all out of shot, and I saw I should do no good without a duck punt. I sat down on an old pile left on the top of the seawall, which had been lately repaired. The duck looked very tempting, but I doubted if I should do much good in broad daylight, even if I had a duck punt without a duck gun. After sitting disconsolately for some time, I got up and wandered on. The dreariness of the scene was most depressing. Everything was brown and grey. Nothing broke the monotony of the wide-stretching mere. The whole scene gave me the impression of a straight line of interminable length, with a speck in the centre of it. That speck was myself. At last, as I turned an angle in the seawall, I saw something lying above high water mark, which looked like a boat. Rejoiced to see any signs of humanity, I quickened my pace. It was a boat, and better still, a duck punt. As I came nearer, I could see that she was old and very likely leaky. But here was a prospect of adventure, and I wasn't going to be readily daunted. On examination, the old craft seemed more watertight than I had expected. At least she held water very well, and if she kept it in, she must equally well keep it out. I turned her over to run the water out, and then, dragging the crazy old boat over the line of seaweed, launched her. But now a real difficulty met me. The paddles were nowhere to be seen. They had doubtless been taken away by the owner and it would be little use searching for them. But a stout stick would do to punt her over the shallow water, and after some little search I found an old stake which would answer well. This was real luck. I had now some hope of bagging a few duck. At any rate, I was afloat and could explore the little islets which barely rose above the brown water. I might at least find some rabbits on them. I cautiously pulled myself towards the black dots, but before I came within range, up rose first one, then another and another like a string of beads, and the whole flight went, with outstretched necks and rapidly beating wings away to my right, and seemed to pitch again beyond the low island some half mile away. The heron had long ago taken himself off, so there was nothing to be done but pole across the mud in pursuit of the duck. I hadn't gone many yards when I found that I was going much faster than I expected, and soon saw the cause. The tide was falling, and I was being carried along with it. This would bring me nearer to my ducks, and I lazily guided the punt with the stake. On rounding the island, I found a new source of interest. The mere opened up to a much larger extent, and away towards my right I could see a break in the low land as if a wide ditch had been cut through, while in this opening, ever and anon, dark objects rose up and disappeared again in a way I couldn't account for. The water seemed to be running off the mud flats and I saw that if I didn't wish to be left high but not dry on the long slimy wastes, I must be careful to keep in the little channels or lakes which acted as natural drains to the acres of greasy mud. 
A conspicuous object attracted my attention some mile or more towards the opening in the land. It was a vessel lying high up on the mud and looking as if she was abandoned. The ducks had pitched a hundred yards or so beyond the island, and I approached as cautiously as I could, but just as I was putting down the stake to take up my gun, there was a swift sound of beating wings and splashing water, and away my birds flew low over the mud towards the old hulk. Here was a chance, I thought, if I could get on board and remain hidden, I might, by patiently waiting, get a shot. I looked at my watch. There was still plenty of daylight left, and the tide was only just beginning to leave the mud. I punted away, therefore, with renewed hope, and was not long in getting up to the old ship. There was just sufficient water over the mud to allow me to approach within ten or twelve feet, but further I could not push the punt. This was disappointing. However, I noticed the deep lake ran round the other side and determined to try my luck there. So, with a slosh and a heave, I got the flat afloat again and made for the deeper water. It turned out quite successful, and I was enabled to get right under the square overhanging counter, while a little lane of water led alongside her starboard quarter. I pushed the nose of the punt into this and was not long in clambering on board by the rusty irons of her forechains. The old vessel lay nearly upright in the soft mud, and a glance soon told she would never be used again. Her gear and rigging were all rotten, and everything valuable had been removed. She was a brig of some two hundred tons, and had been a fine vessel, no doubt. To me, there's always a world of romance in a deserted ship. The places she has been to, the scenes she has witnessed, the possibilities of crime, of adventure... All these thoughts crowd upon me when I see an old hulk lying deserted and forgotten, left to rot upon the mud of some lonely creek. In order to keep my punt afloat as long as possible, I towed her round and moored her under the stern, and then looked over the bulwarks for the duck. There they were, swimming not more than 150 yards away, and they were coming towards me. I remained perfectly concealed under the high bulwark and could see them paddling and feeding in the greasy weed. Their approach was slow, but I could afford to wait. Nearer and nearer they came, another minute, and they would be well within shot. I was already congratulating myself upon the success of my adventure, and thinking of the joy of Jones at this large accession to his larder, when suddenly there was a heavy splash and a wild spluttering rush. The whole pack rose out of the water and went skimming over the mud toward the distant sea. I let off both barrels after them and tried to console myself by thinking I saw the feathers fly from one, but not a bird dropped, and I was left alone in my chagrin. What could have caused the splash, the luckless splash, I wondered? There was surely no one else aboard the ship, and certainly no one could get out here without mud patterns or a boat. I looked round. All was perfectly still. Nothing broke the monotony of the grey scene, sodden and damp and lifeless. A chill breeze came up from the southwest, bringing with it a raw mist which was blotting out the dark distance and fast limiting my horizon. The day was drawing in, and I must be thinking of going home. As I turned round, my attention was arrested by seeing a duck punt glide past me in the now rapidly falling water, which was swirling by the mud bank on which the vessel lay. But there was no one in her. A dreadful thought struck me. It must be my boat. And how shall I get home? I ran to the stern and looked over. The duck punt was gone. The frayed and stranded end of the painter told me how it had happened. I had not allowed for the fall of the tide, and the strain of the punt as the water fell away had snapped the line, old and rotten as it was. I hurried to the bows, and jumping onto the bit saw my punt peacefully drifting away some quarter of a mile off. It was perfectly evident I could not hope to get to her again. It was beginning to rain steadily. I could see that I was in for a dirty weather and became a little anxious about how I was to get back, especially as it was now rapidly growing dark. So thick was it that I couldn't see the low land anywhere and could only judge of its position by remembering that the stern of the vessel pointed that way. The conviction grew upon me that I could not possibly get away from this doleful old hulk without assistance, and how to get it I could not for the life of me see. I hadn't seen a sign of a human being the whole day. It was not likely any more would be about at night. 
However, I shouted as loud as I could and then waited to hear if there were any response. There was not a sound. Only the wind moaned slightly through the stumps of the masts and something creaked in the cabin. Well, I thought at least it might be worse. I shall have shelter for the night while, if I had been left on one of the islands, I should have had to spend the night exposed to the pelting rain. Happy thought. Go below before it gets too dark and see what sort of a berth can be got if the worst comes to the worst. So thinking, I went to the booby hatch and found, as I expected, that it was half broken open and anyone could go below who liked. As I stepped down the rotting companion, the air smelled foul and dank. I went below very cautiously, for I was not at all sure that the boards would bear me. It was fortunate I did so, for as I stepped off the lower step, the floor gave way under my foot, and had I not been holding onto the stair rail, I should have fallen through. Before going any further, I took a look around. The prospect was not inviting. The light was dim. I could scarcely make out objects near me. All else was obscurity. I could see that the whole of the inside of the vessel was completely gutted. What little light there was came through the stern ports. A small round speck of light looked at me out of the darkness ahead, and I could see that the flooring had either all given way or had been taken out of her. At my feet a gleam of water showed me what to expect if I should slip through the floor joists. Altogether a more desolate, gloomy, ghostly place it would be difficult to find. I could not see any bunk or locker where I could sit down, and everything movable had been taken out of the hulk. Groping my way with increasing caution, I stepped across the joists and felt along the side of the cabin. I soon came to a bulkhead. Continuing to grope, I came to an opening. If the cabin was dim, here was blackness itself. I felt it would be useless to attempt to go further, especially as a very damp, foul odour came up from the bilge water in her hold. As I stood looking into the darkness, a creepy, chilly shudder passed over me, and with a shiver, I turned round to look at the cabin. My eyes had now become used to the gloom. A deeper patch of darkness on my right suggested the possibility of a berth, and groping my way over to it, I found that the lower bulk was still entire. Here at least I could rest, if I found it impossible to get to shore. Having some wax vestas in my pocket, I struck a light and examined the bunk. It was better than I expected. If I could only find something to burn, I should be comparatively cheerful. Before reconciling myself to my uncomfortable position, I resolved to see whether I could not get to the shore and went up the rickety stairs again. It was raining hard and the wind had got up. Nothing could be more dismal. I looked over the side and lowered myself down from the main chains to see if it were possible to walk over the mud. I found I couldn't reach the mud at all, and fearful of being unable to climb back if I let go, I clambered up the side again and got on board. It was quite clear I must pass the night here. Before going below, I once more shouted at the top of my voice more to keep up my own spirits than with any hope of being heard, and then paused to listen. Not a sound of any sort replied. I now prepared to make myself as comfortable as I could. It was a dreary prospect. I would rather have spent the night on deck than down below in that foul cabin, but the drenching, driving rain as well as the cold drove me to seek shelter below. It seemed so absurd to be in the position of a shipwrecked sailor within two or three miles of a prosy country hamlet and in a landlocked harbour while actually on land if the slimy deep mud could be called land. I had not many matches left, but I had my gun and cartridges. The idea occurred to me to fire off minute guns. That's what I ought to do, of course. The red flash will be seen in this dark night, for it was dark now and no mistake. Getting up onto the highest part of the vessel, I blazed away. The noise sounded to me deafening. Surely the whole countryside would be aroused. After firing off a dozen cartridges, I waited but the silence only seemed the more oppressive than the blackness or the darker. It's no good. I'll turn in, I thought dejectedly. With great difficulty, I groped my way to the top of the companion ladder and bumped dismally down the steps. If only I had a light, I should be fairly comfortable, I thought. Happy thought, make a spit devil, as we used to when boys call a little cone of damp gunpowder. I got out my last two cartridges and emptying the powder carefully into my hand, I moistened it and worked it up into a paste. 
I then placed it on the smooth end of the rail and lighted it. This was brilliant, at least so it seemed by contrast with the absolute darkness around me. By its light, I was able to find my way to the bunk, and it lasted just long enough for me to arrange myself fairly comfortably for the night. By contriving a succession of matches, I was enabled to have enough light to see to eat my frugal supper, for I had kept a little sherry and a few sandwiches to meet emergencies, and it was a fortunate thing I had. The light and the food made me feel more cheery, and by the time the last match had gone out, I felt worse might have happened to me by a long way. As I lay still, waiting for sleep to come, the absurdity of the situation forced itself upon me. Here was I, to all intents and purposes, as much cut off from all communication with the rest of the world as if I were cast away upon a desert island. The chances were that I should make someone see or hear me the next day. Jones would be certain to have the country searched, and that the longest I should only endure the discomfort of one night and get well laughed at for my pains. But meanwhile, I was absolutely severed from all human contact and was as isolated as Robinson Crusoe, only more so, for I had no other living thing whatever to share my solitude. The silence of the place was perfect, and if silence can move sleep, sleep ought very soon to have come. But when one is hungry and wet, and in a strange, uncanny kind of place, besides being in one's clothes, it is a very difficult thing to go to sleep. First my head was too low, then, after resting it on my arms, I got cramp in them. My back seemed all over bumps when I turned on my side. I appeared to have got rather serious enlargement of the hip joint, and I found my damp clothes smelled very musty. After sighing and groaning for some time, I sat up for a change of position, and nearly fractured my skull in so doing against the remains of what had once been a berth above me. I didn't dare to move in the inky blackness, for I had seen sufficient to know that I might easily break my leg or neck in the flawless cabin. There was nothing for it but to sit still or lie down and wait for daylight. I had no means of telling the time. When I had last looked at my watch before the last match had gone out, it was not more than six o'clock. It might now be about eight, or perhaps not so late. Fancy twelve long hours spent in that doleful black place with nothing in the world to do to pass away the time. I must go to sleep, and so, full of this resolve, I lay down again. I suppose I went to sleep. All I can recollect after lying down is keeping my mind resolutely turned inwards, as it were, and fixed upon the arduous business of counting an imaginary and interminable flock of sheep pass one by one through an ideal gate. This meritorious method of compelling sleep had, no doubt, been rewarded, but I have no means of knowing how long I slept, and I cannot tell at what hour of the night the following strange circumstances occurred, for occur, they certainly did. And I am as perfectly convinced that I was the oral witness to some ghastly crime, as I am that I am writing these lines. I have little doubt I should be laughed at, as Jones laughed at me, to be told that I was dreaming, that I was overtired and nervous. In fact, so accustomed have I become to this sort of thing that I now hardly ever tell my tale. Or, if I do, I put it in the third person, and then I find people believe it, or at least take much more interest in it. I suppose the reason is that people cannot bring themselves to think so strange a thing could have happened to such a prosy, everyday sort of man as myself, and they cannot divest their minds of the idea that I am, well, to put it mildly, drawing on my imagination for facts. Perhaps, if the tale appears in print, it will be believed, as a facetious friend of mine once said to a newly married couple, who had just seen the announcement of their marriage in the Times. Ah, didn't know you were married till you saw it in print. Well, be the time what it may have been. All I know is that the next thing I can remember after getting my fifth hundred sheep through the gate is that I heard two most horrible yells ring through the darkness. I sat bolt upright, and as a proof that my senses were all there, I didn't bring my head this time against the berth overhead, remembering to bend it outward so as to clear it. There was not another sound. The silence was as absolute as a darkness. I must have been dreaming, I thought, but the sounds were ringing in my ears and my heart was beating with excitement. There must have been some reason for this. I never was taken this way before. I couldn't make it out and felt very uncomfortable. I sat there listening for some time, no other sound breaking the deathly stillness. 
and becoming tired of sitting, I lay down again. Once more I set myself to get my interminable flocks through that gate, but I couldn't help myself listening. There seemed to me a sound growing in the darkness, something gathering in the particles of the air as if molecules of the atmosphere were rustling together and with still movement were whispering something. The wind had died down, and I would have gone on deck if I could move, but it was hazardous enough moving about in the light. It would have been madness to attempt to move in that blackness, and so I lay still and tried to sleep. But now there was a sound, indistinct, but no mere fancy, a muffled sound, as of some movement in the forepart of the ship. I listened intently and gazed into the darkness. What was the sound? It didn't seem like rats. It was a dull, shuffling kind of noise, very indistinct, and conveying no clue whatever as to its cause. It lasted only for a short time, but now the cold, damp air seemed to have become more piercingly chilly. The raw iciness seemed to strike into the very marrow of my bones and my teeth chattered. At the same time, a new sense seemed to be assailed. The foul odour, which I had noticed arising from the stagnant water in the bilge, appeared to rise into more objectionable prominence, as if it had been stirred. I can't stand this, I muttered, shivering in horrible aversion at the disgusting odour. I'll go on deck at all hazards. Rising to put this resolve into execution, I was arrested by the noise beginning again. I listened. This time, I distinctly distinguished two separate sounds. One, like a heavy soft weight being dragged along with difficulty. The other, like the hard sound of boots on boards. Could there be others on board after all? If so, why had they made no sound when I clambered on deck or afterwards when I shouted and fired my gun? Clearly, if there were people, they wished to remain concealed, and my presence was inconvenient to them. But how absolutely still and quiet they had kept. It appeared incredible that there should be anyone. I listened intently. The sound had ceased again, and once more the most absolute stillness reigned around. A gentle swishing, wobbling, lapping noise seemed to form itself in the darkness. It increased until I recognised the chattering and bubbling of water. It must be the tide rising, I thought. It's reached the rudder and is eddying around the stern post. This also accounted in my mind for the other noises because, as the tide surrounded the vessel and she thus became waterborne, all kinds of sounds might be produced in the old hulk as she resumed her upright position. However, I couldn't get rid of the chilly, horrid feeling those two screams had produced, combined with the disgusting smell which was getting more and more obtrusive. It was foul, horrible, revolting, like some carrion, putrid and noxious. I prepared to take my chances of damage and rose up to grope my way to the companion ladder. It was a more difficult job than I had any idea of. I had my gun, it was true, and with it I could feel for the joists, but once I let go of the edge of the bunk, I had nothing to steady me and nearly went headlong at the first step. Fortunately, I reached back in time to prevent my fall, but this attempt convinced me that I had better endure the strange horrors of the unknown than the certain miseries of a broken leg or neck. I sat down, therefore, on the bunk. Now that my own movements had ceased, I became aware that the shuffling noise was going on all the time. Well, thought I, they may shuffle, they won't hurt me, and I shall go to sleep again. So reflecting, I lay down, holding my gun, ready to use it as a club, if necessary. Now. It's all very well to laugh at superstitious terrors. Nothing is easier than to obtain a cheap reputation for brilliancy, independence of thought and courage, by deriding the fear of the supernatural when comfortably seated in a drawing room, well lighted and with company. But put those scoffers in a like situation with mine, and I don't believe they would have been any more free from a feeling the reverse of bold, mocking and comfortable than I was. I had read that most powerful ghost story, The Haunted and the Haunters, by the late Lord Lytton, and the vividness of that weird tale had always impressed me greatly. Was I actually now to experience in my own person, and with no possibility of escape, the trying ordeal that bold ghost hunter went through under much more favourable circumstances? He at least had his servant with him. He had fuel and a light, and above all, he could get away when he wanted to. I felt I could face any number of spiritual manifestations if only I had warmth and light. 
but the icy coldness of the air was eating into my bones, and I shivered until my teeth chattered. I couldn't get to sleep. I couldn't prevent myself listening. And at last I gave up the contest and let myself listen. But there seemed now nothing to listen to. All the time I had been refusing to let my ears do their office by putting my handkerchief over one ear and lying on my arm with the other. A confused noise appeared to reach me, but the moment I turned round and lay on my back, everything seemed quiet. It's only my fancy after all, the result of cold and want of a good dinner. I'll go to sleep. But in spite of this, I lay still, listening a little longer. There was a sound of trickling water against the broad bilge of the old hulk, and I knew the tide was rising fast. My thoughts turned to the lost canoe, to reproaching myself with my stupidity in not allowing enough rope or looking at it more carefully. Suddenly, I became all attention again. An entirely different sound now arrested me. It was distinctly a low groan and followed almost immediately by heavy blows, blows which fell upon a soft substance and then more groans and again those sickening blows. There must be men here. Where are they and what is it? I sat up and strained my eyes towards where the sound came from. The sounds had ceased again. Should I call out and let the man or men know that I was here? What puzzled me was the absolute darkness. How could anyone see to hit an object or do anything else in this dense obscurity? It appalled me. Anything might pass an inch's distance and I couldn't tell who or what it was. But how could anything human find its way about any more than I could? Perhaps there was a solid bulkhead dividing the forecastle from me, but it would have to be very sound and with no chink whatever to prevent a gleam or ray of light finding its way out somewhere. I couldn't help feeling convinced that the whole hole was open from one end to the other. Was I really dreaming after all? To convince myself that I was wide awake, I felt in my pockets for my notebook, and pulling out my pencil, I opened the book and holding it in my left hand, wrote as well as I could, by feel alone, I am wide awake. It is about midnight, Christmas Eve, 1877. I found I had got to the bottom of the page, so I shut the book up, resolving to look at it the next morning. I felt curious to see what the writing looked like by daylight. But all further speculation was cut short by the shuffling and dragging noise beginning again. There was no doubt the sounds were louder and were coming my way. I never in all my life felt so uncomfortable. I may as well at once confess it, so frightened. There, in that empty hull, over that boardless floor, over those rotting joists, somebody or something was dragging some heavy weight. What I could not imagine, only the shrieks, the blows, the groans, the dull thumping sounds compelled me to suspect the worst, to feel convinced that I was actually within some few feet of a horrible murder then being committed. That I actually heard the sounds, I had no doubt. That they were growing louder and more distinct, I felt painfully aware. The horror of the situation was intense. If only I could strike a light and see what was passing close there, but I had no matches. I could hear a sound as of someone breathing slowly, stertorously, and a dull groan. And once more the cruel sodden blows fell again, followed by a drip, drip, and heavy drop in the dank water below from which the sickening smell rose, pungent, reeking, horrible. The dragging, shuffling noise now began again. It came quite close to me, so close that I felt I had only to put out my hand to touch it, the thing. Good heavens, was it coming to my bunk? The thing passed, and all the time the dull drip, as if some heavy drops fell into the water below. It was awful. All this time I was sitting up and holding my gun by its barrel, ready to use it if I were attacked. As the sound passed me at the closest, I put out the gun involuntarily, but it touched nothing, and I shuddered at the thought that there was no floor over which the weight could be drawn. I must be dreaming some terribly vivid dream. It couldn't be real. I pinched myself. I felt I was pinching myself. It was no dream. The sweat poured off my brow, my teeth chattered with the cold. It was terrific in its dreadful mystery. And now, the sounds altered. The noises had reached the companion ladder. Something was climbing them with difficulty. The old stairs creaked, bump, thump. The thing was dragged up the steps with many pauses, and at last it seemed to have reached the deck. 
A long pause now followed. The silence grew dense around. I dreaded the stillness, the silence, that made itself be heard almost more than the sounds. What new horror would that awful quiet bring forth? What terror was still brooding in the depths of that clinging darkness, darkness that could be felt? The absolute silence was broken, horribly broken, by a dull drip from the stairs, and then the dragging began again, distant and less distinct, but the steps were louder. They came nearer over my head, the old boards creaked, and the weight was dragged right over me. I could hear it above my head, for the steps stopped, and two distinct raps, followed by a third heavier one, sounded so clearly above me that it seemed almost as if it was something striking the rotten woodwork of the berth over my head. The sounds were horribly suggestive of the elbows and head of a body being dropped on the deck. And now, as if the horrors had not been enough, a fresh ghastliness was added. So close were the raps above me that I involuntarily moved, as if I had been struck by what caused them. As I did so, I felt something drop onto my head and slowly trickle over my forehead. It was too horrible. I sprang up in my disgust, and with a wild cry, I stepped forward and instantly fell between the joists into the rank water below. The shock was acute. Had I been asleep and dreaming before, this must inevitably have roused me up. I found myself completely immersed in water, and for a moment was absolutely incapable of thinking. As it was pitch dark and my head had gone under, I couldn't tell whether I was above water or not. As I felt the bottom and struggled and splashed onto my legs, it was only by degrees I knew I must be standing with my head out of the foul mixture because I was able to breathe easily, although the wet running down from my hair dribbled into my mouth as I stood, shivering and gasping. It was astonishing how a physical discomfort overcame a mental terror. Nothing could be more miserable than my present position, and my efforts were at once directed to getting out of this dreadful place. But let anyone who has ever had the ill luck to fall out of bed in his boyhood try and recollect his sensations, the bewildering realization that he is not in bed, that he does not know where he is, which way to go, or what to do to get back again. Everything he touches seems strange, and one piece of furniture much the same as any other. I well remembered such an accident, and how, having rolled under the bed before I was wide awake, I couldn't for the life of me understand why I couldn't get up, what it was that kept me down. I had not the least idea which way to get out and kept going round and round in a circle under my bed for a long time and should probably have been doing it until daylight had not my sighs and groans awoken my brother who slept in the same room and who came to my help. If then one is so utterly at fault in the room every inch of which one knows intimately, how much more hopeless was my position at the bottom of this old vessel half immersed in water and totally without any clue which would help me get out. I had not the least idea which was the ship's stern or which her stem, and every moment I made with my feet only served to unsteady me, as the bottom was all covered with slime and uneven with the great timbers of the vessel. My first thought on recovering my wits was to stretch my arms up over my head, and I was relieved to find I could easily reach the joists above me. I was always fairly good at gymnastics, I had not much difficulty in drawing myself up and sitting on the joist, although the weight of my wet clothes added to my exertions considerably. Having so far succeeded, I sat and drained, as it were, into the water below. The smell was abominable. I never disliked myself so much, and I shivered with cold. As I could not get any wetter, I determined to go on deck somehow. But where was the companion ladder? I had nothing to guide me. Strange to say, the reality of my struggles had almost made me forget the mysterious phenomena I had been listening to. But now, as I looked round, my attention was caught by a luminous patch which quivered and flickered on my right. At what distance from me, I couldn't tell. It was like the light from a glowworm, only larger and changing in shape, sometimes elongated like a lambent oval, and then it would sway one way or another, as if caught in a draught of air. When I was looking at it and wondering what could cause it, I heard the steps above my head. They passed over me and then seemed to grow louder on my left. A creeping dread again came over me. If only I could get out of this horrible place, but where were the stairs? I listened. The footfall seemed to be coming down some steps. Then the companion ladder must be on my left, but if I moved that way, I should meet the thing, whatever it was, that was coming down. I shuddered at the thought. 
However, I made up my mind. Stretching up my hand very carefully, I felt for the next joist, reached it and crawled across. I stopped to listen. The steps were coming nearer. My hearing had now become acute. I could almost tell the exact place of each footfall. It came closer, closer, quite close, surely, on the very joist in which I was sitting. I thought I could feel the joist quiver and involuntarily move my hand to prevent the heavy tread falling on it. The steps passed on, grew fainter and ceased as they drew near the pale lamp of light. One thing I noticed with curious horror, and that was that although the thing must have passed between me and the light, yet it was never for a moment obscured, which it must have been had any body or substance passed between, and yet I was certain that the steps went directly from me to it. It was all horribly mysterious, and what had become of the other sound, the thing that was being dragged. An irresistible shudder passed over me, but I determined to pursue my way until I came to something. It would never do to sit still and shiver there. After many narrow escapes of falling again, I reached a bulkhead, and cautiously feeling along it I came to an opening. It was the companion ladder. By this time my hands, by feeling over the joists, had become dry again. I felt along the step to be quite sure that it was the stairs, and in doing so I touched something wet, sticky, clammy. Oh, horror, what was it? A cold shiver shook me nearly off the joist, and I felt an unutterable sense of repulsion to going on. However, the fresher air which came down the companion revived me, and conquering my dread, I clambered onto the step. It didn't take long to get upstairs and stand on the deck again. I think I have never in all my life experienced such a sense of joy as I did on being out of that disgusting hole. It was true I was soaking wet and the night wind cut through me like a knife, but these were things I could understand and were a matter of common experience. What I had gone through might only be a question of nerves and had no tangible or visible terror, but it was nonetheless very dreadful and I would not go through such an experience again for words. As I stood cowering under the lee of the bulwark, I looked round at the sky. There was a pale light, as if of daybreak, away in the east, and it seemed as if all my troubles would be over with the dawn. It was bitterly cold. The wind had got round to the north, and I could faintly make out the low shore astern. While I stood shivering there, a cry came down the wind. At first I thought it was a seabird, but it sounded again. I felt sure it was a human voice. I sprang up on the taffrail and shouted at the top of my lungs, then paused. The cry came down clearer and distinct. It was Jones's voice. Had he heard me? I waved my draggled pocket handkerchief and shouted again. In the silence which followed, I caught the words, We're coming! What joyful words! Never did shipwrecked mariner on a lonely isle feel greater delight. My misery would soon be over. Anyhow, I should not have to wait long. Unfortunately, the tide was low and still falling. Nothing but a boat could reach me, I thought, and to get a boat would take some time. I therefore stamped up and down on the deck to get warm, but I had an instinctive aversion for the companion ladder and the deep shadows of the forepart of the vessel. As I turned around in my walk, I thought I saw something moving over the mud. I stopped. It was undoubtedly a figure coming towards me. A voice hailed me in gruff accents. Billy, ahoy! Be anyone aboard? Was anyone aboard? What an absurd question. Here had I been shouting myself hoarse. However, I quickly reassured him, and then understand why my rescue did not sink in the soft mud. He had mud patterns on. Coming up as close as he could, he shouted to me to keep clear, and then threw first one, then the other, clattering wooden board onto the deck. I found them, and under the instructions of my friend, I didn't take long in putting them on. The man was giving me directions as how to manage, but I didn't care how much wetter I got, and dropped over the side into the slime. Sliding and straddling, I managed to get to my friend, and then together we skated, as it were, to the shore, although skating very little represents the awkward splashes and slips I made on my way to land. I found quite a little crowd awaiting me on the bank, but Jones, with ready consideration, hurried me off to a cart he had in a lane near, and drove me home. I told him the chief points of the adventure on our way, but didn't say anything of the curious noises. It's odd how shy a man feels at telling what he knows people will never believe. It was not until the evening of the next day that I began to tell him, and then only after I was fortified by an excellent dinner, 
and some very good claret. Jones listened attentively. He was far too kindly and well-bred to laugh at me, but I could see he didn't believe one word as to the reality of the occurrence. Very strange. How remarkable. Quite extraordinary, he kept saying, with evident interest. But I was sure he put it all down to my fatigue and disordered imagination, and so to do him justice as everybody else to whom I've told the tale since. The fact is, we cannot in this prosaic age believe in anything the least approaching the supernatural, nor do I. But nevertheless, I am as certain as I am that I am writing these words that the thing did really happen and will happen again. May happen every night for all I know, only I don't intend to try and put my belief to the test. I have a theory which of course will be laughed at, and as I'm not in the least scientific, I cannot bolster it up by scientific arguments. It is this, as Mr. Edison has now discovered by certain simple processes human sounds can be reproduced at any future date, so accidentally and owing to the combination of most curious coincidences it might happen that the agonized cries of some suffering being or the sounds made by one at a time when all other emotions are as nothing compared to the supreme sensations of one committing some awful crime, could be impressed on the atmosphere or surface of an enclosed building, which could be reproduced by a current of air passing into that building under the same atmospheric conditions. This is the vague explanation I've given myself. However, be the explanation what it may be, the facts are as I've stated them. Let those laugh who did not experience them. To return to the end of the story, there were two things I pointed out to Jones as conclusive that I wasn't dreaming. One was my pocketbook. I showed it to him, and the words were quite clear, only, of course, very straggling. This is a facsimile of the writing, but I cannot account for the date being 1837. I am wide awake. It is Christmas Eve, 1837. The other point was the horrible stains on my hands and clothes. A foul-smelling dark chocolate stain was on my hair, hands and clothes. Jones said, of course, this was from the rust of the mouldering ironwork, some of which had no doubt trickled down owing to the heavy rain through the defective caulking of the deck. The fact is, there is nothing that an ingenious mind can't explain. But the question is, is the explanation the right one? I could easily account for the phosphorescent light. The water was foul and stagnant, and it was no doubt caused by the same gases which produced the well-known ignis fatus, or will-o'-the-wisp. We visited the ship, and I recovered my gun. There were the same stains on deck as there were in my clothes, and, curiously enough, they went in a nearly straight line over the place where I lay, from the top of the companion to the starboard bulwark. We carefully examined the forepart of the ship. It was as completely gutted as the rest of her. Jones was glad to get on deck again as the atmosphere was very unpleasant, and I had no wish to stay. At my request, Jones made every inquiry he could about the old hulk. Not much was elicited. So far it looked as if it were credited with being haunted. The owner, who had been the captain of her, had died about three years before. His character did not seem amiable, but as he had left his money to the most influential farmer in the district, the country people were unwilling to talk against him. I went with Jones to call on the farmer and asked him point blank if he had ever heard whether a murder had been committed on board the Lily. He stared at me and they laughed. Not as I know of, was all his answer, and I never got any nearer than that. I feel that this is all very unsatisfactory. I wish I could give some thrilling and sensational explanation. I'm sorry I cannot. My imagination suggests many, as no doubt it will to each of my readers who possesses that faculty, but I have only written this to tell the actual facts, not to add to our superabundant fiction. If I ever come across any details bearing upon the subject, I will not fail to communicate them at once. The vessel I found was the Lily of Ghoul, owned by one master Gad Earwaker and built in 1801. Smee by A. M. Burridge No, 
said Jackson with a shy little smile. I'm sorry, I won't play hide-and-seek. It was Christmas Eve and there were fourteen of us in the house. We had had a good dinner and we were all in the mood for fun and games, all that is, except Jackson. When somebody suggested hide-and-seek, there were loud shouts of agreement. Jackson's refusal was the only one. It was not like Jackson to refuse to play a game. "'Aren't you feeling well?' someone asked. "'I'm perfectly all right, thank you,' he said. "'But,' he added with a smile that softened his refusal but didn't change it, "'I'm still not playing hide-and-seek.' "'Why not?' someone asked. He hesitated for a moment before replying. I sometimes go and stay at a house where a girl was killed. She was playing hide-and-seek in the dark. She didn't know the house very well. There was a door that led to the servant's staircase. When she was chased, she thought the door led to a bedroom. She opened the door and jumped and landed at the bottom of the stairs. She broke her neck, of course. We all looked serious. Mrs. Fernley said, How terrible! And were you there when it happened? Jackson shook his head sadly. No, he said, but I was there when something else happened. Something worse. What could be worse than that? This was, said Jackson. He hesitated for a moment, then he said, I wonder if any of you have ever played a game called Smee. It's much better than hide-and-seek. The name comes from It's Me, of course. Perhaps you'd like to play it instead of hide-and-seek. Let me tell you the rules of the game. Every player is given a sheet of paper. All the sheets except one are blank. On the last sheet of paper is written Smee. Nobody knows who Smee is except Smee himself or herself. You turn out the lights and Smee goes quietly out of the room and hides. After a time the others go off in search for Smee, but of course they don't know who they're looking for. When one player meets another he challenges him by saying Smee. The other player answers Smee and they continue searching. But the real Smee doesn't answer when someone challenges. The second player stays quietly beside him. Presently, they will be discovered by a third player. He will challenge and receive no answer, and he will join the first two. This goes on until all the players are in the same place. The last one to find Smee has to pay a forfeit. It's a good, noisy, amusing game. In a big house, it often takes a long time for everyone to find Smee. Perhaps you'd like to try. I'll happily pay my forfeit and sit here by the fire while you play. It sounds like a good game, I remarked. Have you played it too, Jackson? Yes, he answered. I played it in the house that I was telling you about. And she was there, the girl who broke... No, no, said someone else. He told us he wasn't there when she broke her neck. Jackson thought for a moment. I don't know if she was there or not. I'm afraid she was. I know that there were thirteen of us playing the game and there were only twelve people in the house, and I didn't know the dead girl's name. When I heard that whispered name in the dark, it didn't worry me, but I tell you, I'm never going to play that kind of game again. It made me quite nervous for a long time. I preferred to pay my forfeit all at once. We all stared at him. His words didn't make sense at all. Tim Voos was the kindest man in the world. He smiled at us. This sounds like an interesting story, he said. Come on, Jackson, you can tell it to us instead of paying a forfeit. Very well, said Jackson. And here is his story. Have you met the Sangstons? They're cousins of mine and they live in Surrey. Five years ago they invited me to go and spend Christmas with them. It was an old house with lots of unnecessary passages and staircases. A stranger could get lost in it quite easily. Well, I went down for that Christmas. Violet Sangston promised me that I knew most of the other guests. Unfortunately, I couldn't get away from my job until Christmas Eve. All the other guests had arrived there the previous day. I was the last to arrive, and I was only just in time for dinner. I said hello to everyone I knew, and Violet Sangston introduced me to the people I didn't know. Then it was time to go in to dinner. That is perhaps why I didn't hear the name of the tall, dark-haired, handsome girl whom I hadn't met before. Everyone was in rather a hurry, and I'm always bad at catching people's names. She looked cold and clever. She didn't look at all friendly, but she looked interesting and I wondered who she was. I didn't ask, because I was sure that someone would speak to her by name during the meal. Unluckily, however, I was a long way from her at the table. I was sitting next to Mrs. Gorman, and as usual, Mrs. Gorman was being very bright and amusing. Her conversation is always worth listening to, and I completely forgot to ask the name of the dark, proud girl. There were twelve of us, including the Sangstons themselves. We were all young, or trying to be young. 
Jack and Violet Sangston were the oldest and their 17-year-old son Reggie was the youngest. It was Reggie who suggested Smee when the talk turned to games. He told us the rules of the game just as I've described them to you. Jack Sangston warned us all. If you're going to play games in the dark, he said, please be careful of the back stairs on the first floor. A door leads to them and I've often thought about taking the door off. In the dark, a stranger to the house could think they were walking into a room. A girl really did break her neck on those stairs. I asked how it happened. It was about ten years ago, before we came here. There was a party and they were playing hide and seek. The girl was looking for somewhere to hide. She heard somebody coming and ran along the passage to get away. She opened the door, thinking it led to a bedroom. She planned to hide in there until the seeker had gone. Unfortunately, it was the door that led to the back stairs. She fell straight down to the bottom of the stairs. She was dead when they picked her up. We all promised to be careful. Mrs. Gorman even made a little joke about living to be 90. You see, none of us had known the poor girl, and we didn't want to feel sad on Christmas Eve. Well, we all started the game immediately after dinner. Young Reggie Sangson went round making sure all the lights were off, except the ones in the servants' room and in the sitting room where we were. We then prepared twelve sheets of paper. Eleven of them were blank and one of them had Smee written on it. Reggie mixed them all up, then we each took one. The person who got the paper with Smee on it had to hide. I looked at mine and saw that it was blank. A moment later, all the electric lights went out. In the darkness I heard someone moving very quietly to the door. After a minute somebody blew a whistle and we all rushed to the door. I had no idea who was Smee. For five or ten minutes we were all rushing up and down passages and in and out of rooms, challenging each other and answering, Smee? Smee? After a while the noise died down and I guessed that someone had found Smee. After a time I found a group of people all sitting on some narrow stairs. I challenged and received no answer. So Smee was there. I hurriedly joined the group. Presently two more players arrived. Each one was trying to... Each one was hurrying to avoid being last. Jack Sangston was last and was given a forfeit. I think we're all here now, aren't we? he remarked. He lit a match, looked up the staircase and began to count. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, he said, and then laughed. That's silly. There's one too many. The match went out and he lit another and began to count. He got as far as twelve, but then he looked puzzled. There are thirteen people here, he said. I haven't counted myself yet. Oh, nonsense, I laughed. You probably began with yourself and now you want to count yourself twice. His son took out his electric torch. It gave a better light than the matches and we all began to count. Of course, there were twelve of us. Jack laughed. Well, he said, I was sure I counted thirteen twice. From halfway up the stairs, Violet Sangston spoke nervously. I thought there was somebody sitting two steps above me. Have you moved, Captain Ransom? The captain said that he hadn't. But I thought there was somebody sitting between Mrs. Sangston and me. Just for a moment, there was an uncomfortable something in the air. A cold finger seemed to touch us all. For that moment, we all felt that something odd and unpleasant had just happened and was likely to happen again. Then we laughed at ourselves and at each other, and we felt normal again. There were only twelve of us, and that was that. Still laughing, we marched back to the sitting room to begin again. This time, I was Smee. Violet Sangston found me while I was searching for a hiding place. That game didn't last long. Soon there were twelve people and the game was over. Violet felt cold and wanted a jacket. Her husband went up to their bedroom to fetch it. As soon as he'd gone, Reggie touched me on the arm. He was looking pale and sick. Quick, he whispered. I've got to talk to you. Something horrible has happened. We went into the breakfast room. What's the matter? I asked. I don't know. You were Smee last time, weren't you? Well, of course, I didn't know who Smee was. While Mother and the others ran to the west side of the house and found you, I went east. There's a deep clothes cupboard in my bedroom. It looked like a good hiding place. I thought that perhaps Smee might be there. I opened the door in the dark and touched somebody's hand. Smee? I whispered. There was no answer. I thought I'd found Smee. Well, I don't understand it, but I suddenly had a strange, cold feeling. I can't describe it, but I felt that something was wrong. So I turned on my electric torch, and there was nobody there. Now I'm sure I touched a hand, and nobody could get out of the cupboard because I was standing in the doorway. What do you think? You imagined that you touched a hand, I said. 
He gave a short laugh. I knew you'd say that, he said. Of course I imagined it. That's the only explanation, isn't it? I agreed with him. I could see that he still felt shaken. Together we returned to the sitting room for another game of Smee. The others were all ready and waiting to start again. Perhaps it was my imagination, although I'm almost sure that it wasn't. But I had a feeling that nobody was really enjoying the game anymore, but everybody was too polite to mention it. All the same, I had the feeling that something was wrong. All the fun had gone out of the game. Something deep inside me was trying to warn me. Take care, it whispered. Take care. There was some unnatural, unhealthy influence at work in the house. Why did I have this feeling? Because Jack Sangston had counted 13 people instead of 12? Because his son imagined he'd touched someone's hand in an empty cupboard? I tried to laugh at myself, but I didn't succeed. Well, we started again. While we were all chasing the unknown Smee, we were all as noisy as ever, but it seemed to me that most of us were just acting. We were no longer enjoying the game. At first, I stayed with the others, but for several minutes no Smee was found. I left the main group and started searching on the first floor at the west side of the house, and there, while I was feeling my way along, I bumped into a pair of human knees. I put out my hand and touched a soft, heavy curtain. Then I knew where I was. There were tall, deep windows with window seats at the end of the passage. The curtains reached to the ground. Someone was sitting in the corner of one of the window seats behind the curtain. Aha, I thought, I've caught Smee. So I pulled the curtain to one side and touched a woman's arm. It was a dark, moonless night outside. I couldn't see the woman sitting in the corner of the window seat. Smee? I whispered. There was no answer. When Smee is challenged, he or she does not answer. So I sat down beside her to wait for the others. Then I whispered. What's your name? And out of the darkness beside me, the whisper came. Brenda Ford. I didn't know the name, but I guessed at once who she was. I knew every girl in the house by name except one, and that was the tall, pale, dark girl. So here she was, sitting beside me on the window seat shut in between a heavy curtain and a window. I was beginning to enjoy the game. I wondered if she was enjoying it too. I whispered one or two rather ordinary questions to her and received no answer. Smee is a game of silence. It's a rule of the game that Smee and the person or persons who have found Smee have to keep quiet. This, of course, makes it harder for the others to find them. But there was nobody else about. I wondered, therefore, why she was insisting on silence. I spoke again and got no answer. I began to feel a little annoyed. Perhaps she's one of those cold, clever girls who have a poor opinion of all men, I thought. She doesn't like me, and she's using the rules of the game as an excuse for not speaking. Well, if she doesn't like sitting here with me, I certainly don't want to sit with her. I turned away from her. I hope somebody finds us soon, I thought. As I sat there, I realized that I disliked sitting beside this girl very much indeed. That was strange. The girl I'd seen at dinner had seemed likable in a cold kind of way. I noticed her and wanted to know more about her. But now, I felt really uncomfortable beside her. The feeling of something wrong, something unnatural, was growing. I remember touching her arm and I trembled with horror. I wanted to jump up and run away. I prayed that someone else would come along soon. Just then I heard light footsteps in the passage. Someone on the other side of the curtain brushed against my knees. The curtain moved to one side and a woman's hand touched my shoulder. Smee! whispered a voice that I recognised at once. It was Mrs. Gorman. Of course she received no answer. She came and sat down beside me. And at once I felt very much better. It's Tony Jackson, isn't it? she whispered. Yes, I whispered back. You're not Smee, are you? No, she's on my other side. She reached out across me. I heard her fingernails scratch a woman's silk dress. Hello, Smee. How are you? Who are you? Oh, it's against the rules to talk. Never mind, Tony. We'll break the rules. Do you know, Tony, this game is beginning to annoy me a little. I hope they aren't going to play it all evening. I'd like to play a nice quiet game all together beside a warm fire. Me too, I agreed. Can't you suggest something to them? There's something rather unhealthy about this particular game. I'm sure I'm being very silly, but I can't get rid of the idea that we've got an extra player. Somebody who ought not to be here at all. 
That was exactly how I felt, but I didn't say so. However, I felt very much better. Mrs. Gorman's arrival had chased away my fears. We sat talking. I wonder when the others will find us, said Mrs. Gorman. After a time, we heard the sound of feet and young Reggie's voice shouting, Hello? Hello? Is anybody there? Yes, I answered. Is Mrs. Gorman with you? Yes. What happened to you? You've both got forfeits. We've been waiting for you for hours. But you haven't found Smee yet, I complained. You haven't, you mean. I was Smee this time. But Smee's here with us, I cried. Yes, agreed Mrs. Gorman. The curtain was pulled back and we sat looking into the eye of Reggie's electric torch. I looked at Mrs. Gorman and then on my other side, between me and the wall, was an empty place on the window seat. I stood up at once. Then I sat down again. I was feeling very sick and the world seemed to be going round and round. There was somebody here, I insisted, because I touched her. So did I, said Mrs. Gorman, in a trembling voice. And I don't think anyone could leave this window seat without us knowing. Reggie gave a shaky little laugh. I remembered his unpleasant experience earlier that evening. Someone's been playing jokes, he said. Are you coming down? We were not very popular when we came down to the sitting room. I found the two of them sitting behind a curtain on a window seat, said Reggie. I went up to the tall, dark girl. So you pretended to be Smee and then went away, I accused her. She shook her head. Afterwards we all played cards in the sitting room and I was very glad. Sometime later Jack Sangston wanted to talk to me. I could see that he was rather cross with me and soon he told me the reason. Tony, he said, I suppose you're in love with Mrs. Gorman, that's your business. But please don't make love to her in my house during a game. You kept everyone waiting, it was very rude of you and I'm ashamed of you. But we weren't alone, I protested. There was somebody else there, someone who was pretending to be Smee. I believe it was that tall, dark girl, Miss Ford. She whispered a name to me. Of course, she refused to admit it afterwards. Jack Sangston stared at me. Miss who? he breathed. Brenda Ford, she said. Jack put a hand on my shoulder. Look here, Tony, he said. I don't mind a joke, but enough is enough. We don't want to worry the ladies. Brenda Ford is the name of the girl who broke her neck on the stairs. She was playing hide-and-seek here ten years ago. The Ghost of Christmas Eve by J. M. Barry. A few years ago, as some may remember, a startling ghost paper appeared in the monthly organ of the Society for Haunting Houses. The writer guaranteed the truth of his statement and even gave the name of the Yorkshire Manor House in which the affair took place. The article and the discussion to which it gave rise agitated me a good deal and I consulted Pettigrew about the advisability of clearing up the mystery. The writer wrote that he distinctly saw his arm pass through the apparition and come out at the other side. And indeed, I still remember his saying so next morning. He had a scared face, but I had presence of mind to continue eating my rolls and marmalade as if my briar had nothing to do with the miraculous affair. Seeing that he made a paper of it, I suppose he is justified in touching up the incidental details. He says, for instance, that we were told the story of the ghost which is said to haunt the house just before going to bed. As far as I remember, it was only mentioned at luncheon, and then sceptically. Instead of there being snow falling outside and an eerie wind wailing through the skeleton trees, the night was still and muggy. Lastly, I did not know until the journal reached my hands that he was put into the room known as the haunted chamber, nor that in that room the fire is noted for casting weird shadows upon the walls. This, however, may be so, the legend of the manor house ghost he tells precisely, as it is known to me. The tragedy dates back to the time of Charles I and is led up to by a pathetic love story which I need not give. Suffice it that for seven days and nights the old steward had been anxiously awaiting the return of his young master and mistress from their honeymoon. On Christmas Eve, after he had gone to bed, there was a great clanging of the doorbell. Flinging on a dressing gown, he hastened downstairs. 
According to the story, a number of servants watched him and saw by the light of his candle that his face was an ashy white. He took off the chains of the door, unbolted it, and pulled it open. What he saw, no human being knows. But it must have been something awful, for without a cry, the old steward fell dead in the hall. Perhaps the strangest part of the story is this, that the shadow of a burly man holding a pistol in his hand entered by the open door, stepped over the steward's body, and gliding up the stairs disappeared. No one could say where. Such is the legend. I shall not tell the many ingenious explanations of it that have been offered. Every Christmas Eve, however, the silent scene is said to be gone through again, and tradition declares that no person lives for twelve months at whom the ghostly intruder points his pistol. On Christmas Day, the gentleman who tells the tale in the scientific journal created some sensation at the breakfast table by solemnly asserting that he had seen the ghost. Most of the men present scouted his story, which may be condensed into a few words. He had retired to his bedroom at a fairly early hour, and as he opened the door, his candlelight was blown out. He tried to get a light from the fire, but it was too low, and eventually he went to bed in the semi-darkness. He was wakened, he did not know at what hour, by the clanging of a bell. He sat up in bed, and the ghost story came in a rush to his mind. His fire was dead, and the room was consequently dark. Yet by and by he knew, though he heard no sound, that his door had opened. He cried out, Who is that? But got no answer. By an effort he jumped up and went to the door, which was ajar. His bedroom was on the first floor, and looking up the stairs he could see nothing. He felt a cold sensation at his heart, however, when he looked the other way. Going slowly and without a sound down the stairs was an old man in a dressing gown. He carried a candle. From the top of the stairs only part of the hall is visible, but as the apparition disappeared, the watcher had the courage to go down a few steps after him. At first, nothing was to be seen, for the candlelight had vanished. The dim light, however, entered by the long, narrow windows which flanked the hall door, and after a moment... The onlooker could see that the hall was empty. He was marvelling at this sudden disappearance of the steward when, to his horror, he saw a body fall upon the hall floor within a few feet of the door. The watcher cannot say whether he cried out, nor how long he stood there, trembling. He came to himself with a start as he realised that something was coming up the stairs. Fear prevented his taking flight. And in a moment, the thing was at his side. Then he saw indistinctly that it was not the figure he had seen descend. He saw a younger man in a heavy overcoat, but with no hat on his head. He wore on his face a look of extravagant triumph. The guest boldly put out his hand towards the figure. To his amazement, his arm went through it. The ghost paused for a moment and looked behind it. It was then the watcher realized that it carried a pistol in its right hand. It was by this time in a highly strung condition, and he stood trembling lest the pistol should be pointed at him. The apparition, however, rapidly glided up the stairs and was soon lost to sight. Such are the main facts of the story, none of which I contradicted at the time. I cannot say absolutely that I can clear up this mystery, but my suspicions are confirmed by a good deal of circumstantial evidence. This will not be understood unless I explain my strange infirmity. Wherever I went, I used to be troubled with a presentiment that I had left my pipe behind. Often, even at the dinner table, I paused in the middle of a sentence as if stricken with sudden pain. Then my hand went down to my pocket. Sometimes, even after I felt my pipe, I had a conviction that it was stopped and only by a desperate effort did I keep myself from producing it and blowing down it. I distinctly remember once dreaming three nights in succession that I was on the Scotch Express without it. More than once, I know, I have wandered in my sleep 
looking for it in all sorts of places, and after I went to bed, I generally jumped out, just to make sure of it. My strong belief, then, is that I was the ghost seen by the writer of the paper. I fancy that I rose in my sleep, lighted a candle and wandered down the hall to feel if my pipe was safe in my coat, which was hanging there. The light had gone out when I was in the hall. Probably the body seen to fall on the hall floor was some other coat, which I had flung there to get more easily at my own. I cannot account for the bell, but perhaps the gentleman in the haunted chamber dreamt that part of the affair. I had put on the overcoat before reascending. Indeed, I may say the next morning I was surprised to find it on a chair in my bedroom, also to notice that there were several long streaks of candle grease on my dressing gown. I conclude that the pistol, which gave my face such a look of triumph, was my briar, which I found in the morning beneath my pillow. The strangest thing of all, perhaps, is that when I awoke, there was a smell of tobacco smoke in the bedroom. Save Your Gate by Russell Kirk They say nicht, they say nicht, every nicht and alle, fire and sleet and candle licht, and Christ receive thy soul, a like-wake dirge. This old street, scarcely wider than a lane, could not be long. At the far end of it there loomed a Norman tower of a parish church. Mark Findlay had the notion that if he were to hurry the length of the street and turn to the right beyond the church, he might reach a modern square with cinemas and a taxi rank. Needing to catch the midnight train for London, he must find a cab soon. And, his cough growing worse, he must get out of the wet. In Northminster, this Christmas Eve, a light snow had fallen, then melted, lingering as fog. Between trains, he'd strolled the streets for nearly three hours, his head so filled with worries that he scarcely had noticed anything he passed. Looking back the way he had come, and coughing hard, he saw by the great clock on the cathedral tower that it was nearly half-past eleven. In more ways than one, he had lost his sense of direction. He was uncertain what way the railway station lay. This was a charming narrow street of Georgian houses, or perhaps some of them from Queen Anne's time, two or three little whitewashed steps going up to each door. That he could make out with the low-lying chilly mist. There seemed to be no shop fronts, and only one hanging signboard, a few yards directly in front of him, visible by gaslight, this being perhaps the only lane in Northminster still lit by gas lamps. The Cross Keys, Paul Mariner, resident manager. Above this gilt lettering was the well-painted symbol of two crossed keys. Decades ago had he glimpsed this street sometime. He had been in Northminster only once before, early in the war. Much of the town had been uglified since then, but this street, supposing it to be the same street, looked unchanged. Had he seen that pub sign before? As he lingered on the corner, coughing ferociously, a clergyman brushed past him in the dim light. Could you tell me, Finley began, but the parson hurried on, umbrella over his head. Perhaps he had taken Finley for a tramp, what with his cough, his pale face and his mud-splashed coat. Someone else, looking rather like a civil servant, was striding in the opposite direction, on the other side of the street. I'm sorry, but could you help me? Finley called to him. A smug face was turned toward him briefly, but there was no slackening of pace, and the second man went round the corner. Somewhere he must get directions. Should he go a few paces down that street, ring the bell for the porter, if there might be a night porter at a small hotel of this sort nowadays, and ask his way to a cab rank or to the station. He hesitated, for the past several months he had evaded most decisions, big or small. Yes, he had best try the cross keys. The stained glass windows were alight in that church at the far end, Findlay noticed as he made his way past the Georgian doors, and a bell was tolling from the tower. Just as he was about to mount the stone steps, another coughing fit racked him. Bent and hacking, he leaned towards the bow front of the cross keys. Then the hotel door opened and down the steps to him came a lean man. That's a graveyard cough, the man said sympathetically. I could hear you in the parlour. It wasn't the cough that carried him off, but the coffin they carried him off in. Do come in for a whiskey. Startled, Finley contrived to gasp. I need to catch a train. The man had taken his arm, a forceful, tall man, with a whimsical, handsome face. Hacking like that, you'll never reach the station. This stranger, but was he quite a stranger, told him. 
I'll see that you make your train if you must. He held open the heavy door. Within the corridor was warm and colourful, with dark oak wainscoting and good framed prints on the walls. But it's after hours, Finley protested. Oh, the public bar's closed, but at the cross keys, they always can serve something to a bona fide traveller like you. The man was briskly helping him off with his muddy coat. Come into the residence parlour. I've put up for the night and the manager knows me. I don't think there's time, Finley muttered as he was propelled into the parlour. This insistent host, who seemed tolerably sober, spoke like an educated man and behaved like an officer. Time? The lean man chuckled. It's time, gentlemen, time. That's no problem for you and me, is it? I say, you're a Canadian, aren't you? I know you. You're Finley, Mark Finley. I was thinking of you, coincidence, I'd have said once, before I heard that cough of yours in the street. Finley stared into that confident face. Had he known this man? A certain recklessness made those bold features memorable. Perhaps this man had been a soldier. To Finley came some faint memory of an hour's tipsy talk, a curious conversation with a man who had looked rather like this long ago. Some chance acquaintance, but encountered where? Did we meet? Why, right here in 39, Finley inquired. I'm sorry, but I don't recall your name. I'm Ralph Bain. Of course it's here. Take that chair, the lever one, Finley. Jimmy! The corpulent, florid-faced porter or waiter in scarlet jacket and brass buttons ambled toward them. Whiskey and sodas, Jimmy, Bain ordered, and put more coals on that fire. You remember Mr. Finley, Jimmy? He's passing through Northminster, unless after all we can persuade him to take a room. Anyhow, he's bona fide. It's your sort that makes this job a pleasure, Mr. Finley, sir, said Jimmy, who was an Irishman. The fire blazed up on the broad hearth below the Adam chimney place. The whisky glasses came promptly on a heavy silver tray. Finley had ceased to cough. Surely this was the jolly hotel of his dim memory with the faded upholstery or shiny leather of its easy chairs, the green draperies of his tall windows, the solid dark furniture of yesteryear, the big oriental rug a bit frayed, and especially that massive framed painting of the Highland cattle. Now he even recalled the looming silver tea urn on the mahogany sideboard. A few people still sat in this resident parlour, perhaps waiting for the midnight peal from the cathedral's bells. Several of them had nodded to him or smiled at him when Bain almost had forced him into an armchair, and an old lady said, Good evening. Could he have seen her before? Or perhaps the granddaughter of the girl companion beside her? Ralph Bain he did recollect fairly well by this time. Rather a wag, this Bain, he recalled with a talent for telling stories that seemed tall. They had taken to each other, he and Bain, when in that year of so long vanished they had happened to fall into talk in his very pub. The Bain of Finley's memory had seemed no younger than a man who sat opposite him now. His host must be remarkably well preserved, not a grey hair to his head. Did he dye his hair? Bain had been chatting with him lightly for several minutes, but Finley, needing to catch that train and fretting about tomorrow's hard decisive conference, scarcely had paid attention. What a heartening room this was, everyone in it good-natured and healthy-looking. The sound of the ancient church bell penetrated through the thick drapes of the bow front. Yes, it was a single bell tolling, not a peal. At any moment, Finley feared the tolling might be mingled with the chimes of the cathedral clock, sounding the third quarter of the hour, which would mean that he'd have a narrow squeak to make his train, even though the trains generally ran late or lingered at the platform. Bain noticed that his guest was listening to the bell, that's a good sound, isn't it, Finley? Lord knows when that church commenced the custom. There was a Saxon or Danish church on the site, you know. The day before Christmas, from time out of mind, they've tolled that bell from early morning to midnight, one stroke for every year since the nativity. The church is our friend Canon Hoodman's, you remember, besides his being chapter treasurer. They must be coming close to stroke 1,939. Shall we drink to that? Thanks, Mr. Bain, Finley heard himself saying. He was drowsy in this cordial room after the long ride down from Aberdeen and after tramping those Northminster streets in miserable vacillation. But no, I'd order another round for us except for my train. I'm going to have to say good night. We keep a flight in Aberdeen now. If you ever get up to, call me Bain or Ralph or Rafe. That whiskey's your medicine, Finlay. I told you so before your cough stopped. As for the train, why, you'll be aboard it, if you really mean to be. I give you my word. I'll see you to the cab. We have heard the chimes at midnight, Master Shallow. Forgive me, but you've not been long this side of the border, I take it. We came down from Aberdeen today, Bain, and if I don't meet three important men for breakfast at the Hyde Park Hotel, here Findlay grimaced, it's all up with me. I've been in oil rigs in Aberdeen for the past two years. I'm not so young as I was, and my wife's in a bad way. Now, I'm in deep trouble. 
Not enough ready money and the banks pressing me hard about the overdrafts. The careless smile faded from Bain's rough mouth. Bain stared at him incredulously. Why, Findlay, that sort of thing doesn't signify for you and me here, you know. Overdrafts? Oh, don't you know? Don't you, actually? The moment I dragged you in, I thought you seemed a bit odd. If you don't mind me saying so, it was as if I'd taken hold of a ghost. I'm told that some people scarcely are aware of the change when they've just crossed the border. If you don't mind, Mark Finley, old man, just how was it you died? Jimmy was setting two more whiskies before them on the little Indian table. Bane must have given him a sign. The cosy parlour went round for Finley. Hadn't he thought too often of dying, and dying swiftly, whatever the consequences? Hadn't he thought of that escape, all the hours he'd walked down those Northminster streets? Did the death urge show in his face? For a moment, the two commercial travellers in the corner, and the old lady with her girl companion, and smiling Jimmy, seemed to fade into nothingness. Finley saw only Bane's daredevil face gone sober and pallid on the instant. Had one whisky been too many for Bane, or for himself? What do you mean? Finley tried not to stammer. I'm no deader than you are. I might as well be dead, though, if I'm not in London eight hours from now. Dead? Bane laughed, though it seemed to require some effort from him almost as if Bane were frightened. Of course we're not dead, old man. Here, do I seem dead? Leaning forward, he gripped Finley's hand. There, a good fleshy shake, eh? Why, we wouldn't be just here if we were dead, truly dead, would we, Finley? I put the question to you too bluntly. That's one of my silly habits got in the army. What I meant to say was this. How did you cross the border? Bane drank, and then resumed. There's no harm in calling it dying. We all have to pass through the jaws of death to reach the cross keys or any other good sort of place. Corruption, putting on incorruption and all that. We all have to die so that we can rise, don't we? Was it, was it hard, your crossing? Is the cross keys the first place you've come to this side of eternity? If so, there's the more honour for me as the first friend to greet you. Bane drained his glass. Now, drink your dram, old man, because there's nothing left for us to fret about. Never, never. It wasn't the cough that carried him off, but the coffin they carried him off in, I say. Could it have been that you crossed the border just outside the door of this hotel when I heard you hacking there? Finley stood up. Was this host of his drunk or was he a lunatic? Bane seemed neither, but he might be both. Had he and Bane talked of something like this so long ago? Not this precisely, but something about death and eternity? Finley couldn't be bothered, though Bane was rather amusing, not with that train to catch. Thanks again, he told Bane. My train won't wait, and it's not just my own future depending on that breakfast tomorrow. There's my wife, my sick wife, to think of. Good night. If you're ever in Aberdeen... You really don't follow me, do you, old man? Bane frowned in seeming perplexity. If you leave now, you'll miss Canon Hoodman. Train won't wait. Why, any train you want will be waiting for you whenever you want it. I'll be taking a train myself to Ayrshire after a night or two here at the Cross Keys. There's a young woman I mean to walk the moors with. Time doesn't signify... There's no time for you and me, thank God, Finley. Why, we've not even begun to talk. How can I explain? You and I aren't dead, though I died once, and I suppose you have too. We've only just begun to live fully. Look here, Mark Finley, do you believe in what you read in the papers? Half the time. Excuse me, but where did you hang my hat and coat? Jimmy, Bane called, but he did not tell Jimmy to fetch his guest's coat and hat. Jimmy, find us today's post, and the Times too. Mr. Finley needs to see them. Newspapers inserted in those old-fangled wooden rods were hanging by the sideboard. It passed through Finley's mind that the Cross Keys Hotel, like a beetle of a hostelry preserved in amber, retained amenities that had vanished nearly everywhere else. Jimmy brought two papers. They were full of news about the military stalemate. On the front page of both, the date was 24th September 1939. What the hell is this? Finley was two-thirds angry. It was 1939 when it came to Northminster the first time. This is now, said Bane. There's only now, praise be, whatever now you like, whatever now I like. Sit down, old man. You need somebody with a head and a tongue better than mine to inform you. I say, Jimmy, Canon Hoodman still is in the house talking to Mr. Mariner. Could you give him my compliments and ask him to join us if it's no trouble to him? Tell him that I may even have a ghost to show him. Well, in any event, he must have missed his train by this time, Finley reckoned. After all, how much did that matter? Those three insufferable men at the Hyde Park Hotel would do nothing for him, as the odds stood. The intended meeting had been a last forlorn hope. Fortune had conspired against him, 
and the stars in their courses. He might as well finish this whisky. He might as well finish many whiskies. Now it was all over for him. And all over for Marion. Poor sick Marion. She had told him he would fail. His nerve had failed him. And he had failed her. In his bag, at the station luggage room, there lay secreted a sufficient quantity of prescribed capsules, long hoarded. He had feared that he might require them, the whole lot of them, after that Hyde Park breakfast. After he should leave this hotel, he could swallow them at the station without having to face that grim breakfast after all. Now he had all the time in the world. If a coroner should call it an overdose, there would be some insurance money left for Mary in any way, despite their having borrowed heavily these past six months. It is a far, far better thing I do, Finley sat down again. There were worse places to spend one's last evening than this snug and well-appointed hotel parlour with this friendly madman to entertain him. Jimmy, said Finley, another round of drinks. Nothing matters now. Bain had been peering at him, as if doubting whether this guest were flesh and blood. Actually, Bain said, it does matter, don't you know, old man? It matters if you've not yet crossed the border. It matters if really you're here at the Cross Keys by some uncanny chance, or by providence, I should say. If you're to understand Canon Hoodman, who explains mysteries as well as anybody could, you're not to be half seas over. I beg your pardon, Jimmy. Forget those whiskey sodas and bring us a pot of tea. And some sandwiches, Jimmy. His last slim hope of survival abandoned. Finley was willing to humour this quizzical lunatic called Ralph Bain. He did feel hungry after those vain, bewildered hours in the foggy streets. All right, he told Bain, have your fun with me. That was a clever ploy, putting those old newspapers on the racks. Were you merely hoping that some fool, any fool, might come in tonight and be teased by you? Or do you play these macabre tricks at this hotel every night? Why am I a ghost and not you? It's a private joke, very nearly, that ghost, Bain said. The canon and I call anybody a ghost who turns up here, or turns up anywhere else in eternity, but doesn't belong. Anybody who hasn't properly crossed the border, but gets into eternity somehow, for a moment, so to speak, and then passes back into time again. Let me tell you, Finley, you're a rarity. Here at the old cross keys on Christmas Eve, in the year of our Lord, 1939, Reading in the papers about the Twilight War, you're experiencing a timeless moment. You're in two states of being simultaneously, I fancy. Bain leaned towards him earnestly. Yet I don't think you've passed through the jaws of death. The canon says he's met such people more than once, but I haven't. You believe you're alive, and so you are, though not only in the way you think of life. I fancy you'll leave this pleasant room whenever you need to, and you'll catch that confounded train of yours, and you'll find yourselves back in whatever year of grace you fancy you belong in. That's why I call you a ghost. Bane grinned at him reassuringly. You don't belong here, and yet you do belong. To me, you're unreal. You frighten me a trifle, as ghosts are supposed to. The next thing I know, I may be looking straight through you at the back of the chair. You needn't dread me. Oh, but here's the tea, and here's the cannon. The cannon's grip was as hearty as Bane's. Canon Hoodman was a cheerful North Countryman with a broad mouth and thick spectacles. You may not remember me, Mark Finley began, not just yet, or you may recall only a few words we spoke to each other. If you like, I can offer you a good many more words now. Canon Bane was saying, I lug in an old acquaintance from the street and then find he's not crossed the border, or so he says. It's a conundrum. When first you and Finley and I sat down together, I wished we could go on talking forever and hear the possibilities come to pass, but Finley doesn't understand, and he wants to be off immediately to his private misery. Was this purported canon some actor recruited by the whimsical Bane? Certainly Hoodman looked his part, collar and black suit and all. Finley forced himself to enter into the spirit of this rag. Here is the question, Finley told Hoodman. Is Ralph Bane crazy or am I? I'd like to know what sort of innkeeper puts 1939 newspapers into this residence parlour. You seem out of sorts, Finley Hoodman said, but melancholy men are the wittiest. The manager of this hotel is a very sensible person, and he puts those papers there because he, like everybody else in this house, knows that tonight is Christmas Eve. The verger is nearly done tolling the bell in my old church, in the year of our Lord, 1939. Another wag. Finley chuckled mordantly, pouring himself another cup of tea with shaking hand. Are you suggesting, Canon, if you really are a Canon, that I'm in hell, having coughed myself to death in the street outside, and that I'm condemned to spend eternity in this room, a little pocket of time called December the 24th, 1939? 
The canon smiled, a warm and humorous smile. Au contraire, Finley, if you and Bain and I were in hell, I fancy we'd not be discussing these mysteries. The damned, as I understand it, have no past and no future, no memories, no expectations. You're in a very different state from that. This sly game wasn't unpleasant, and afterwards there would be those deadly capsules at the station, the door out of this prison house of life leading to the jail yard. With that final ace in the hole, why not play up? Well then, Canon Hoodman, Finley went on, if we three and the other people in this parlour are in prison forever in a cosy moment in time, how is it that you and Bane talk of remembering me? And how can I remember Bane, though I've forgotten you, if I ever met you before? If we're all dead men, how can we talk about memories and expectations, especially expectations? I told you, old man, Bane thrust in, we're not dead, none of us. We've come fully alive. And we're not locked up here, it's just that we've chosen or fallen into this one timeless moment. It's a good particular timeless moment, isn't it? No special significance to it, I suppose. Simply three friends arguing comfortably before a fire on a winter's night. But we have our choices of moments to experience afresh. It's up to you and the canon and me separately. This moment is a random sample of timeless moments. There are stronger moments, far stronger for any of us. Why, if he chose just now, the canon might be praying some drafty church at Smokefall, I suppose, or could be trading stories with some good chaps in a tent in the western desert, say, instead of disputing with you. It's a question of what you wish to experience all over again. As they talked, the heavy tolling of that church bell contributed to the illusion of timelessness that these two fantastics had contrived for him. Outside in the street there sounded the footfalls and murmuring of a good many people with now and again children's laughter, folk on their way to midnight service at that church. The hotel was real, the people outside were real, these two clever companions of his were real. Findlay wondered about his own reality. The canon was speaking now. Yes, all good moments or hours or days that you ever experience are forever present to you, whenever you want them, after you've crossed the border. We were told that we shall have bodies, we have them. You say that you've not yet crossed the border, Finley. Well, once you have crossed, and if really you're still in time, that might be a long while yet for you, then, God willing, you'll understand, as we two can't make you understand. What's wrong with the present everlasting moment, Bane inquired. I know, no cigars. Jimmy, fetch that box of cigars. Finley chose a cigar, presumably his last, a Burma cheroot. He seemed to recall that good Burma cheroots had been easier to find in 1939. Where nowadays did the resident manager of the Cross Keys obtain his supply? All right, Finley responded, keeping his temper despite this waggery. For the sake of argument, I'll accept your metaphysics. We're not dead, but in eternity, you say. Well, what sort of great expectations are we supposed to indulge, aside from another sandwich and another cigar? You two talk well, but this occasion might turn boring if it were to run on forever. The canon took him up. As Bane said, it's your choice of all you've experienced. Suppose that your wedding day was among the best days of your life, Mark, or what you call your life. Think of this. You can experience that wedding whenever you like, for eternity. You mean that I can remember my wedding day? I don't need you to tell me that, canon. You mean that happiness is emotion recollected in tranquility. That's not enough for me. I don't have any tranquility left. The canon shook his head amicably. No, it's not memory that I mean. It's this, rather, if you're given grace, the good things of your life are experienced in all the fullness of your senses whenever you desire them. True, there's another side to the coin. If you've rejected the grace of God, then the evil things of your life are forever present, and you can't escape them. This unexpected moment here in the Cross Keys may be a sign for you, Mark Finley, a sign that you may know grace in death if you choose it. Ah, how these two jesters, these masters of the dry mock, stuck to their hobgoblin consistency. Finley laughed sardonically. So you two can convert yourselves into bridegrooms in the twinkling of an eye whenever you're in that mood. Not I, Bane admitted. I never married. I joined my regiment a few weeks after we met here, Finley, and I was good at killing, but at nothing else. After El Alamein, where I took some bullets, they gave me the military cross. When the war was over, I got my little pension and drank hard every day. Any girl would have been an idiot to have married me. I asked one, and she said it would never do, and she was right. That's the young woman I mean to walk on the moors again with when I leave the Cross Keys. Why trouble yourself with her, Finley objected, grinning. There is no marriage or giving in marriage, I'm told, where we three are supposed to be just now. Or can you have your fun all the same? 
So far as marriage goes, Bane said quietly, we don't want what we didn't know at the other side of the border. As for fun, I found in the end that love was better. Have you ever read Augustine? The canon asked Finley. No, he learned that truth while he was still in time. I take it, canon, you can chat with St. Augustine whenever the fit is on you. Finley scoffed. And that Bane can play games with Helen of Troy. Oh, nothing of that sort, the canon paused. How may I make it clear? We live only once, and the experiences of that one active life are eternal. I don't meet Augustine in the Cross Keys Hotel, say, because he never was here, naturally, and because I wasn't at Hippo in the 5th century, naturally. Augustine and you and I are joined only through the mystical body. As for Bane, may I speak for you, Bane, an hour stroll in the moors of that lady merely talking means more to him than could be the conquest of the face that launched a thousand ships. We don't long for the physical presence of Augustine or of Helen, because the reality which we know satisfies us, which it didn't when we were in time. I don't mean that this fuller reality of ours is static. Instead, our awareness of every timeless moment grows deeper and takes on more meaning. For a small instance, though you and I talked in this room before, you don't remember a word I said. I suspect, however, that you'll not forget what I'm saying to you now. What about these expectations of yours, when there's nothing new under the sun for you? When you do nothing but enlarge the same experiences, Finley thought he had caught this subtle canon there. Expectations, Finley. This living moment in the cross keys isn't the whole of the life eternal. Hardly, the canon chuckled. Nor is the reenactment of the love of created things the whole of what we expect. You know the phrase, the beatific vision. Well, that's not a phrase only. That vision is yet to come for Bain and for me. Perhaps we experience a provisional judgment now and so remain tied in some sense, to experiences within time. When the last judgment's done, perhaps all expectations will be fulfilled, so that there'll be nothing left to long for. These are only words to you. Formerly, they weren't much more than words to me. Words are tools that break in the hand. After you cross the border, you'll know the truths that I can't put into words for you. There's the last desperate resort of Parsons, Finley thought, flight into bloodless abstractions, empty formulas. He would try another track. I fancy you must have been a model of propriety, Bane, to deserve a comfortable birth in eternity like this, eh? I didn't deserve it at all, Bane looked down at his strong hands. I told you, I was good for nothing but killing, and that was true to the very end, until almost the last. I was all ego, loving nobody but myself. My last action was to destroy a man, or what had been a man. Men are always saying that they'd die for this woman or that one. I said it too, but what mattered... I did it, for that young woman I mentioned. I did it to shield her from somebody, and I took him with me. It was a beastly business on a high roof, and we went down together, into a river. Do you know, Findlay, ordinarily we don't talk about crossing the border. I took the liberty of asking you how you crossed, but only because I sensed that there was something peculiar about your coming. It's bad form, since nasty memories don't fit in here. Yet, in its way, even that last fight of mine was a high experience. That one decent impulse of mine is why I'm in the same room with the cannon. Because of that violent act for love, she'd never have taken me. Everything else I'd done was forgiven. Except for the tolling of the bell, there was silence for a little space. Finley had to admire Bane for his consummate skill of straight-faced yarn spinning. Then Bane added, Now, beyond desire, I'm her friend and know her always. Just like Dante and Beatrice, Finley commented, puffing dryly on his cheroot. Rather, said the canon, knocking the ash from his cigar, like Dante and Beatrice. How often did these two saturnine comedians find the opportunity to pull some chance visitor's leg so systematically? You gave your life too for a female friend, Canon Hoodman. No, the canon answered. I had no choice as to how I crossed. My wife and I crossed together. I believe a bomb struck our old house in the close, so we've never been parted. She'll be in the congregation when I give the homily at midnight service and we walk back to the close, together. People who come after us in time don't know that handsome old house of ours, more's the pity, but nothing that's in time can endure forever. For my wife and me, nevertheless, every stick and brick of that house endures in eternity. They couldn't really expect him to swallow all this farrago. Of course, these two were aware that he knew they talked tongue-in-cheek. They hoped to provoke him into an outburst of indignation at such stuff and nonsense. Finley wouldn't let them have that satisfaction. So, you have the pleasure of your wife's company, Canon, he said smoothly, and you enjoy your lady friend's conversation, Bane. That's pleasant. 
But what about souls you're not so fond of? That man who rolled off the roof into the river with you, for instance, Bane. That foul chap. Bane blew a smoke ring. God only knows. You can be sure our paths don't cross. In our father's house there are many mansions, but they're not all on the same floor. Finley yawned. The jest was wearing thin and he was dog-tired, and in his luggage those capsules awaited him. These two jesters might be sobered by what they would read about him in the tomorrow's papers. After all, his would be the cream of the jest. You're quite worn out, Finley, I can see, the canon was murmuring. And oh, we've been boring you. Jimmy, is that Mr. Mariner still up? Good, ask him to come if he has a moment. The manager of this old-fashioned hotel turned out to be a small, quick man with deep-set eyes. Something for you, Captain Bain. Mariner, Bain said to him. Our friend Finley has come a long way. Show him one of your rooms, will you? He still thinks of taking a train, but he might be tempted. This is a very old house, Finley, part of the building medieval, worth seeing, worth sleeping in. Would you prefer a haunted chamber, Mr. Finley, Mariner offered. Apparently he was a confederate of Bane and Hoodman. I don't know that we can supply a spectral monk on demand, but there's a room available where Coleridge slept once. Mariner led the three of them up a short flight of carpeted stairs, down a longish corridor, up a longer and steeper flight, and round a corner. Behind the door which he opened was a snug single bedroom. Massive beams in its low ceiling, papered in blue, with a glistening old bedstead of some rare wood. If you'd care to sleep deep, Mr. Finley, Mariner said, I'd wake you when you might require a call, supposing that you should want it at all. I must have missed that train of mine long ago, thanks to these gentlemen, Finley answered. To sleep in that old bed for eternity, that prospect was far more attractive than were those capsules waiting at the station. It's your choice entirely, Bane was saying in his ear. Free will, you know, old man. Yet why choose either bed or poison? These chance companions with their long-faced wit who cared enough about him to twit him for an hour. Somehow they put heart into him. His cough seemed to have faded away altogether, and these two friends and the atmosphere of this old house were invigorating. He wouldn't swallow those capsules tonight, after all, he decided. Perhaps never. But Marion mustn't be left to suffer alone, and there were the sensibilities of railway porters to think of. Hyde Park breakfast or no Hyde Park breakfast, something yet might be accomplished in London with somebody or other, given will, given spirit, given grace. Behind this evening charade, there had moved some quickening power, some hint or glimpse of hope. How a man dies, and with what justification, this absurd interval of talk had wakened Finley to awareness of such matters. He would not plunge himself into nothingness without another effort or two. Canon Hoodman had been watching him closely. If you feel ready for a bed, the canon remarked, laying a hand on Finley's shoulder, you'll not find a better one than this, Mark. But if you've got duties you can't ignore, why, there's always a London train for you. No thanks, gentlemen, Finley said. I have miles to go before I sleep. Bane nodded. You still have hostages to fortune, eh? And after all... That bed can be yours whenever you need it. I'll walk you to the corner. At the front door, Finley shook hands with the canon and Mariner. The two of them, if Mariner was privy to the plot, kept up to the last their roguish elaborate pretense. We'll have more to discuss when you come to us, the canon told him. I don't expect to pass this way again. Yet you shall. Finley and Bane went down the white steps and into the drifting mist. The canon waved. That short street, it turned out, was quite as lovely as Finley had thought it to be, in his glimpses before Bane had drawn him into the cross keys. If only he could have lingered to inspect it more closely. Ahead of them, the stragglers were hastening through the churchyard and into the lighted church, and that bell tolled on. Do you have any idea when the first morning train will leave, Bane? It'll be there for you, old man, and all of us at the cross keys will be there for you when you look for us. Ask the cabby. Then the bell ceased to toll. Finley glanced at his watch. He must have stopped in the cross keys. He looked backward toward the cathedral tower, yet surely the cathedral clock too had run down, and at the same time, for it stood at half past eleven. Here you are, Mark, Bain was telling him. Do you make out a cab rank to the right? Just wave and shout. Wage the good fight, old man. Sure enough, there was a taxi a few yards distant on the modern street which intersected this ancient lane. Finley waved and shouted and the taxi rolled to him. To the station, sir, the driver was asking now. Just a moment, Ralph, you rascal. You've given me a lively evening, though. Finally turned to face Ralph Bain. Bain was not to be seen. Nor was the Cross Keys Hotel, 
only a vacant site strewn with rubble. The charming houses of the old street were gone, or at least most of them, and those which survived were ghastly derelicts. That street was wholly lifeless. Finley swung back toward the taxi. Beyond it was the church with the Norman Tower, or rather the wreck of a church, all dark, no glass in what remained of the window tracery. The nave was roofless, a mercury vapour lamp in the modern street glowered over the churchyard, and by it Finley could make out a metal sign which read, Public Gardens, Custody of the Ministry of Works. Station, sir. Time enough to catch the midnight train for London. You can hear it rumbling down from the north now. Finley tumbled into the cab. Tell me, tell me, how long has that street been smashed? Before my time. 1941, they say. Them German firebombs done for it. Some year, they say, the corporation will get round to building council houses there. And what's the name of that street? Saviour Gate, sir. The Snow by Hugh Walpole The second Mrs. Ryder was a young woman, not easily frightened, but now she stood in the dusk of the passage, leaning back against the wall, her hand on her heart, looking at the grey-faced window, beyond which the snow was steadily falling against the lamplight. The passage where she was led from the study to the dining room, and the window looked out onto the little paved path that ran at the edge of the cathedral green. As she stared down the passage, she couldn't be sure whether the woman were there or no. How absurd of her! She knew the woman wasn't there. But if the woman wasn't, how was it she could discern so clearly the old-fashioned grey cloak, the untidy grey hair, and the sharp outline of the pale cheek and pointed chin? Yes, and more than that, the long sweep of the grey dress falling in folds to the ground, the flash of a gold ring on the white hand. No, 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 this was madness. There was no one and nothing there. Hallucination. Very faintly a voice seemed to come to her. I warned you. This is for the last time. The nonsense. How far now was her imagination to carry her? Tiny sounds about the house, the running of a tap somewhere, a faint voice from the kitchen. These and something more had translated themselves into an imagined voice. The last time. But her terror was real. She was not normally frightened by anything. She was young and healthy and bold, fond of sport, hunting, shooting, taking any risk. Now she was truly stiffened with terror. She couldn't move, couldn't advance down the passage as she wanted to, and find light, warmth, safety in the dining room. All the time the snow fell steadily, stealthily, with its own secret purpose, maliciously, beyond the window in the pale glow of the lamplight. Then, unexpectedly, there was a noise from the hall, opening of doors, a rush of feet, a pause, and then, in clear, beautiful voices, the well-known strains of Good King Wenceslas. It was the cathedral choir boys on their regular Christmas round. This was Christmas Eve. They always came just at this hour on Christmas Eve. With an intense, almost incredible relief, she turned back into the hall. At the same moment her husband came out of the study. They stood together smiling at a little group of muffled, becoated boys who were singing heart and soul in the job so that the old house simply rang with their melody. Reassured by the warmth and human company, she lost her terror. It had been her imagination. Of late, she had been none too well. That was why she was so irritable. Old Dr. Bernard was no good. He didn't understand her case at all. After Christmas, she would go to London and have the very best advice. Had she been well, she could not half an hour ago have shown such miserable temper over nothing. She knew that it was over nothing, and yet that knowledge didn't make it any easier for her to restrain herself. After every bout of temper, she told herself that there should never be another, and then Herbert said something irritating, one of his silly muddle-headed stupidities, and she was off again. She could see now, as she stood beside him at the bottom of the staircase, that he was still feeling it. She had certainly half an hour ago said some abominably rude, personal things, things that she had not at all meant, and he had taken them in his meek, quiet way. 
Were he not so meek and quiet, did he only pay her back in her own coin, she would never lose her temper. Of that, she was sure. But who wouldn't be irritated by that meekness and by the only reproachful thing that he ever said to her? Eleanor understood me better, my dear. To throw the first wife up against the second, wasn't that the most tactless thing that a man could possibly do? And Eleanor, that worn, elderly woman, the very opposite of her own gay, bright, amusing self. That was why Herbert had loved her, because she was gay and bright and young. It was true that Eleanor had been devoted, that she had been so utterly wrapped up in Herbert that she lived only for him. People were always recalling her devotion, which was sufficiently rude and tactless of them. Well, she couldn't give anyone that kind of old-fashioned sugary devotion. It wasn't in her, and Herbert knew it by this time. Nevertheless, she loved Herbert in her own way, as he must know, know it so well that he ought to pay no attention to the burst of temper. She wasn't well. She would see a doctor in London. The little boys finished their carols, were properly rewarded, and tumbled like feathery birds out into the snow again. They went into the study, the two of them, and stood beside the big open log fire. She put her hand up and stroked his thin, beautiful cheek. I'm so sorry to have been cross just now, Bertie. I didn't mean half I said, you know. But he didn't, as he usually did, kiss her and tell her that it didn't matter. Looking straight in front of him, he answered, Well, Alice, I do wish you wouldn't. It hurts horribly. It upsets me more than you think, and it's growing on you. You make me miserable. I don't know what to do about it, and it's all about nothing. Irritated at not receiving the usual commendation for her sweetness in making it up again, she withdrew a little and answered, Oh, all right. I've said I'm sorry. I can't do any more. But tell me, he insisted, I want to know, what makes you so angry, so suddenly, and about nothing at all? She was about to let her anger rise, her anger at his obtuseness, obstinacy, when some fear checked her, some strange, unanalyzed fear, as though someone had whispered to her, Look out, this is the last time. It's not altogether my own fault, she answered, and left the room. She stood in the cold hall, wondering where to go. She could feel the snow falling outside the house and shivered. She hated the snow, she hated the winter, this beastly, cold, dark English winter that went on and on, only at last to change into a damp, soggy English spring. In Polchester it was unusual to have so heavy a snowfall. This was the hardest winter that they had known for many years. When she urged Herbert to winter abroad, which he could quite easily do, he answered her impatiently. He had the strongest affection for this pokey, dead-and-alive cathedral town. The cathedral seemed to be precious to him. He wasn't happy if he didn't go and see it every day. She wouldn't wonder if he didn't think more of the cathedral than he did of herself. Eleanor had been the same. She had even written a little book about the cathedral, about the black bishop's tomb and the stained glass and the rest. What was the cathedral, after all? Only a building. She was standing in the drawing-room, looking out over the dusky, ghostly snow to the great hulk of the cathedral that Herbert said was like a flying ship, but to herself was more like a crouching beast, licking its lips over the miserable sinners that it was forever devouring. As she looked and shivered, feeling that in spite of herself her temper and misery were rising so that they threatened to choke her, it seemed to her that her bright and cheerful firelit drawing-room was suddenly open to the snow. It was exactly as though cracks had appeared everywhere, in the ceiling, the walls, the windows, and that through these cracks the snow was filtering, dribbling in little tracks of wet down the walls, already perhaps making pools of water on the carpet. This was of course imagination, but it was a fact that the room was most dreadfully cold, although a great fire was burning, and it was the coziest room in the house. Then, turning, she saw the figure standing by the door. This time, there could be no mistake. It was a grey shadow and yet a shadow with form and outline. The untidy grey hair, the pale face like a moonlit leaf, the long grey clothes, and something obstinate, vindictive, terribly menacing in its pose. She moved and the figure was gone. There was nothing there and the room was warm again, quite hot in fact. But young Mrs. Ryder, who had never feared anything in all her life save the vanishing of her youth, was trembling, so that she had to sit down, and even then her trembling did not cease. Her hand shook on the arm of the chair. She had created this thing out of her imagination of Eleanor's hatred of her, and her own hatred of Eleanor. It was true, 
that they had never met. But who knew but that spiritualists were right, and Eleanor's spirit, jealous of Herbert's love for her, had been there, driving them apart, forcing her to lose her temper, and then hating her for losing it. Such things might be, but she hadn't much time for speculation. She was preoccupied with her fear. It was a definite, positive fear, the kind of fear that one has just before one goes under an operation. Someone or something was threatening her. She clung to her chair as though to leave it were to plunge into disaster. She looked around her everywhere. All the familiar things, the pictures, the books, the little tables, the piano, were different now, isolated, strange, hostile, as though they had been won over by some enemy power. She longed for Herbert to come and protect her. She felt most kindly to him. She would never lose her temper with him again, and at that same moment some cold voice seemed to whisper into her ear, You had better not. It will be for the last time. At length she found courage to rise, cross the room, and go up to dress for dinner. In her bedroom courage came to her once more. It was certainly very cold, and the snow, as she could see when she looked between her curtains, was falling more heavily than ever. But she had a warm bath, sat in front of her fire, and was sensible again. For many months this odd sense that she was watched and accompanied by someone hostile to her had been growing. It was the stronger, perhaps, because of the things that Herbert told her about Eleanor. She was the kind of woman, he said, who once she loved anyone would never relinquish her grasp. She was utterly faithful. He implied that her tenacious fidelity had been at times a little difficult. She always said, he added once, that she would watch over me until I rejoined her in the next world. Poor Eleanor, he sighed. She had a fine religious faith, stronger than mine, I fear. It was always after one of her tantrums that young Mrs. Ryder had been most conscious of this hallucination, this dreadful discomfort of feeling that someone was near you who hated you. But it was only during the last week that she had begun to fancy that she actually saw anyone, and with every day her sense of this figure had grown stronger. It was, of course, only nerves, but it was one of those nervous afflictions that became tiresome indeed, if you didn't rid yourself of it. Mrs. Ryder, secure now in the warmth and intimacy of her bedroom, determined that henceforth everything should be sweetness and light, no more tempers. These were the things that did her harm. Even though Herbert were a little trying, wasn't that the case with every husband in the world? And wasn't it Christmas time? Peace and goodwill to men. Peace and goodwill to Herbert. They sat down opposite to one another in a pretty little dining room hung with Chinese woodcuts, the table gleaming and the amber curtains richly dark in the firelight. But Herbert wasn't himself. He was still brooding, she supposed, over their quarrel of the afternoon. Weren't men children? Incredible the children they were. So when the maid was out of the room, she went over to him, bent down and kissed his forehead. Darling, you're still cross. I can see you are. You mustn't be. Really, you mustn't. It's Christmas time, and if I forgive you, you must forgive me. You forgive me, he asked, looking at her in his most aggravating way. What have you to forgive me for? Well, that really was too much. When she had taken all the steps, humbled her pride, she went back to her seat, but for a while couldn't answer him because the maid was there. When they were alone again, she said, summoning all her patience, Bertie, dear, do you really think that there's anything to be gained by sulking like this? It isn't worthy of you. It isn't really. He answered her quietly. Sulking? No, that's not the right word, but I've got to keep quiet. If I don't, I shall say something I'm sorry for. Then, after a pause in a low voice as though to himself, these constant rows are awful. Her temper was rising again, another self that had nothing to do with her real self, a stranger to her and yet a very old, familiar friend. Don't be so self-righteous, she answered, her voice trembling a little. These quarrels are entirely my own fault, aren't they? Eleanor and I never quarrelled, he said, so softly that she scarcely heard him. No, because Eleanor thought you perfect. She adored you. You've often told me. I don't think you perfect. I'm not perfect either. But we've both got faults. I'm not the only one to blame. We'd better separate, he said, suddenly looking up. We don't get on now. We used to. I don't know what's changed everything, but, as things are, we'd better separate. She looked at him and knew that she loved him more than ever. But because she loved him so much, she wanted to hurt him. 
and because he had said that he thought he could get on without her, she was so angry that she forgot all caution. Her love and her anger helped one another. The more angry she became, the more she loved him. I know why you want to separate, she said. It's because you're in love with someone else. How funny, something inside her said. You don't mean a word of this. You've treated me as you have, and then you leave me. I'm not in love with anyone else, he answered her steadily, and you know it. But we're so unhappy together that it's silly to go on, silly. The whole thing has failed. There was so much unhappiness, so much bitterness in his voice, that she realised that at last she had truly gone too far. She had lost him. She had not meant this. She was frightened, and her fear made her so angry that she went across to him. Very well, then, I'll tell everyone what you've been, how you've treated me. Not another scene, he answered wearily. I can't stand any more. Let's wait. Tomorrow is Christmas Day. He was so unhappy that her anger with herself maddened her. She couldn't bear this sad, hopeless disappointment with herself, their life together, everything. In a fury of blind temper, she struck him. It was as though she was striking herself. He got up and, without a word, left the room. There was a pause, and then she heard the hall door close. He had left the house. She stood there, slowly coming under her control again. When she lost her temper, it was as though she sank under water. When it was all over, she came once more to the surface of life, wondering where she'd been and what she'd been doing. Now she stood there, bewildered, and then at once she was aware of two things. One, that the room was bitterly cold, and the other, that someone was in the room with her. This time, she didn't need to look around. She did not turn at all, but only stared straight at the curtained windows, seeing them very carefully, as though she were summing them up for some future analysis, with their thick amber folds, gold rod, white lines, and beyond them the snow was falling. She didn't need to turn, but with a shiver of terror, she was aware that the grey figure who had all these last weeks been approaching ever more closely was almost at her very elbow. She heard her quite clearly. I warned you. That was the last time. At the same moment, Onslow the butler came in. Onslow was broad, fat and rubicund, a good, faithful butler with a passion for church music. He was a bachelor and, it was said, disappointed of women. He had an old mother in Liverpool to whom he was greatly attached. In a flash of consciousness, she thought of all these things when he came in. She expected him also to see the grey figure at her side, but he was undisturbed. His ceremonial complacency clothed him securely. Mr. Fairfax has gone out, she said firmly. Oh, surely he must see something, feel something. Yes, madam. Then smiling rather grandly, it's snowing hard. Never seen it harder here. Shall I build up the fire in the drawing room, madam? No, thank you, but Mr. Fairfax's study. Yes, madam, I only thought that as this room was so warm, you might find it chilly in the drawing room this room warm when she was shivering from head to foot, but holding herself lest he should see. She longed to keep him there, to implore him to remain, but in a moment he was gone, softly closing the door behind him. Then a mad longing for flight seized her, and she couldn't move. She was rooted there to the floor, and even as wildly trying to cry, to scream, to shriek the house down, she found that only a little whisper would come. She felt the cold touch of a hand on hers. She didn't turn her head. Her whole personality, all her past life, her poor little courage, her miserable fortitude, was summoned to meet this sense of approaching death, which was as unmistakable as a certain smell or the familiar ringing of a gong. She had dreamt in nightmares of approaching death, and it had always been like this, a fearful constriction of the heart, a paralysis of the limbs, a choking sense of disaster like an anaesthetic. You were warned, something said to her again. She knew that if she turned, she would see Eleanor's face, set, white, remorseless. The woman had always hated her, been vilely jealous of her, protecting her wretched Herbert. Certain vindictiveness seemed to release her. She found that she could move, her limbs were free. She passed to the door, ran down the passage into the hall. Where could she be safe? She thought of the cathedral where tonight there was a carol service. She opened the hall door and just as she was, meeting the thick, involving, muffling snow, she ran out. 
She started across the green towards the cathedral door. Her thin black slippers sank in the snow. Snow was everywhere, in her hair, her eyes, her nostrils, her mouth, on her bare neck, between her breasts. Help, 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 she wanted to cry, but the snow choked her. Lights whirled about her. The cathedral rose like a huge black eagle and flew towards her. She fell forward, and even as she fell, a hand, far colder than the snow, caught her neck. She lay struggling in the snow, and as she struggled there, two hands of an icy, fleshless chill closed about her throat. Her last knowledge was of the hard outline of a ring pressing into her neck. Then she lay still, her face in the snow, and the flakes eagerly, savagely covered her. The Kit Bag by Algernon Blackwood When the words not guilty sounded through the crowded courtroom that dark December afternoon, Arthur Wilbraham, the great criminal KC and leader for the triumphant defence, was represented by his junior, but Johnston, his private secretary, carried the verdict across to his chambers like lightning. It's what we expected, I think, said the barrister without emotion, and personally I'm glad the case is over. There was no particular sign of pleasure that his defence of John Turk, the murderer, on a plea of insanity, had been successful, for no doubt he felt, as everybody who had watched the case felt, that no man had ever better deserved the gallows. I'm glad too, said Johnston. He had sat in the court for ten days watching the face of the man who had carried out, with callous detail, one of the most brutal and cold-blooded murders of recent years. The counsel glanced up at his secretary, they were more than an employer and employed, for family and other reasons. They were friends. Ah, I remember, yes, he said with a kind smile. And you want to get away for Christmas. You're going to skate and ski in the Alps, aren't you? If I was your age, I'd come with you. Johnson laughed shortly. He was a young man of twenty-six with a delicate face, like a girl's. I can catch the morning boat now, he said. But that's not the reason I'm glad the trial is over. I'm glad it's over because I've seen the last of that man's dreadful face. It positively haunted me. That white skin with the black hair brushed low over the forehead is a thing I shall never forget, and the description of the way the dismembered body was crammed and packed with lime into that... Don't dwell on it, my dear fellow, interrupted the other, looking at him curiously out of his keen eyes. Don't think about it. Such pictures have a trick of coming back when one least wants them. He paused a moment. Now go, he added presently, and enjoy your holiday. I shall want all your energy for my parliamentary work when you get back, and don't break your neck skiing. Johnston shook hands and took his leave. At the door he turned suddenly. I knew there was something I wanted to ask you, he said. Would you mind lending me one of your kit bags? It's too late to get one tonight, and I leave in the morning before the shops are open. Of course, I'll send Henry over with it to your rooms. You shall have it the moment I get home. I promise to take great care of it, said Johnston gratefully. Delighted to think that within thirty hours he would be nearing the brilliant sunshine of the high Alps in winter. The thought of that criminal court was like an evil dream in his mind. He dined at his club and went on to Bloomsbury, where he occupied the top floor in one of those old, gaunt houses in which the rooms are large and lofty. The floor below his own was vacant and unfurnished, and below that were other lodgers who he did not know. It was cheerless and he looked forward heartily to a change. The night was even more cheerless. It was miserable, and few people were about. A cold, sleety rain was driving down the streets before the keenest east wind he had ever felt. It howled dismally along the big, gloomy houses of the great squares, and when he reached his rooms he heard it whistling and shouting over the world of black roofs beyond his windows. In the hall he met his landlady shading a candle from the draughts with her thin hand. This come by a man from Mr. Wilburn, sir. She pointed to what was evidently the kit bag, and Johnson thanked her and took it upstairs with him. I shall be going abroad in the morning for ten days, Mrs. Monks, he said. And I hope you'll have a very merry Christmas, sir, she said in a raucous, wheezy voice that suggested spirits. And better weather than this. I hope so, too, replied a lodger, shuddering a little as the wind went roaring down the street outside. When he got upstairs, he heard the sleet volleying against the window panes. He put his kettle on to make a cup of hot coffee and then set about putting a few things in order for his absence. 
And now I must pack, such as my packing is, he laughed to himself, and set to work at once. He liked the packing, for it brought the snow mountain so vividly before him, and made him forget the unpleasant scenes of the past ten days. Besides, it wasn't very elaborate in nature. His friend had lent him the very thing, a stout canvas kit bag, sack-shaped, with holes round the neck for the brass bar and padlock. It was a bit shapeless, true, and not much to look at, but its capacity was unlimited, and there was no need to pack carefully. He shoved in his waterproof coat, his fur cap and gloves, his skates and climbing boots, his sweaters, snow boots and ear caps, and then, on top of these, he piled his woolen shirts and underwear, his thick socks, putties and knickerbockers. The dress suit came next in case the hotel people dressed for dinner, and then, thinking of the best way to pack his white shirts, he paused a moment to reflect. That's the worst of these kit bags, he mused vaguely, standing in the centre of the sitting room, where he had come to fetch some string. It was after ten o'clock. A furious gust of wind rattled the windows as though to hurry him up, and he thought with pity of the poor Londoners whose Christmas would be spent in such a climate, whilst he was skimming over snowy slopes in bright sunshine and dancing in the evening with rosy-cheeked girls. Ah, that reminded him, he must put in his dancing pumps and evening socks. He crossed over from his sitting-room to the cupboard on the landing where he kept his linen. And as he did so, he heard someone coming softly up the stairs. He stood still a moment on the landing to listen. It was Mrs. Monks's step, he thought. She must be coming up with the last post. But then the steps ceased suddenly, and he heard no more. There were at least two flights down, and he came to the conclusion they were too heavy to be those of his bibulous landlady. No doubt they belonged to a late lodger who had mistaken his floor. He went into his bedroom and packed his pumps and dress shirts as best he could. The kit bag by this time was two-thirds full and stood upright on its own base like a sack of flour. For the first time he noticed that it was old and dirty, the canvas faded and worn, and that it had obviously been subjected to rather rough treatment. It was not a very nice bag to have sent him, certainly not a new one, or one that his chief valued. He gave the matter a passing thought and went on with his packing. Once or twice, however, he caught himself wondering who it could have been wandering down below, for Mrs. Monks had not come up with letters, and the floor was empty and unfurnished. From time to time, moreover, he was almost certain he heard a soft tread of someone padding about over the bare boards, cautiously, stealthily, as silently as possible, and, further, that the sounds had lately been coming distinctly nearer. For the first time in his life, he began to feel a little creepy. Then, as though to emphasise this feeling, an odd thing happened. As he left the bedroom, having just packed his recalcitrant white shirts, he noticed that the top of the kit bag locked over towards him with an extraordinary resemblance to a human face. The canvas fell into a fold like a nose and forehead, and the brass rings for the padlock just filled the position of the eyes. A shadow, or was it a travel stain, for he couldn't tell exactly, looked like hair. It gave him rather a turn, for it was so absurdly, so outrageously, like the face of John Turk, the murderer. He laughed and went into the front room, where the light was stronger. That horrid case has got on my mind, he thought. I should be glad of a change of scene and air. In the sitting room, however, he was not pleased to hear again that stealthy tread upon the stairs, and to realise that it was much closer than before as well as unmistakably real. And this time he got up and went out to see who it could be creeping about on the upper staircase at so late an hour. But the sound ceased. There was no one visible on the stairs. He went to the floor below, not without trepidation, and turned on the electric light to make sure that no one was hiding in the empty rooms of the unoccupied suite. There was not a stick of furniture large enough to hide a dog. Then he called over the banisters to Mrs. Monk's, but there was no answer, and his voice echoed down into the dark vault of the house and was lost in the roar of the gale that howled outside. Everyone was in bed and asleep, everyone except himself and the owner of this soft and stealthy tread. My absurd imagination, I suppose, he thought. It must have been the wind after all, although it seemed so very real and close, I thought. He went back to his packing, it was by this time getting on towards midnight. He drank his coffee up and lit another pipe, the last before turning in. It's difficult to say exactly 
at what point fear begins. When the causes of that fear are not plainly before the eyes, impressions gather on the surface of the mind, film by film. As ice gathers upon the surface of still water, but often so lightly that they claim no definite recognition from the consciousness, then a point is reached where the accumulated impressions become a definite emotion, and the mind realises that something has happened. With something of a start, Johnston suddenly recognised that he felt nervous, oddly nervous also, that for some time past the causes of this feeling had been gathering slowly in his mind, but that he had only just reached the point where he was forced to acknowledge them. It was a singular and curious malaise that had come over him, and he hardly knew what to make of it. He felt as though he were doing something that was strongly objected to by another person, another person, moreover, who had some right to object. It was a most disturbing and disagreeable feeling, not unlike the persistent promptings of conscience, almost, in fact, as if he were doing something he knew to be wrong. Yet, though he searched vigorously and honestly in his mind, he could nowhere lay his finger upon the secret of this growing uneasiness, and it perplexed him. More, it distressed and frightened him. Pure nerves, I suppose, he said aloud with a forced laugh. Mountain air will cure all that. Ah, he added, still speaking to himself, and that reminds me, my snow glasses. He was standing by the door of the bedroom during this brief soliloquy, and as he passed quickly towards the sitting room to fetch them from the cupboard, he saw, out of the corner of his eye, the indistinct outline of a figure standing on the stairs a few feet from the top. It was someone in a stooping position with one hand on the banisters and the face peering towards the landing. And at the same moment he heard a shuffling footstep. The person who had been creeping about below all this time had at last come up to his own floor. Who in the world could it be? And what in the name of heaven did he want? Johnston caught his breath sharply and stood stock still. Then, after a few seconds' hesitation, he found his courage and turned to investigate. The stairs, he saw, to his utter amazement, were empty. There was no one. He felt a series of cold shivers run over him, and something about the muscles of his legs gave a little and grew weak. For the space of several minutes, he peered steadily into the shadows that congregated about the top of the staircase, where he had seen the figure, and then he walked fast, almost ran in fact, into the light of the front room. But hardly had he passed inside the doorway when he heard someone come up the stairs behind him with a quick bound and go swiftly into his bedroom. It was a heavy, but at the same time a stealthy footstep, the tread of somebody who did not wish to be seen, and it was at this precise moment that the nervousness he had hitherto experienced leaped at the boundary line and entered the state of fear, almost of acute, unreasoning fear. Before it turned into terror was a further boundary to cross, and beyond that again lay the region of pure horror. Johnston's position was an unenviable one. By Jove, there was someone on the stairs then, he muttered, his flesh crawling all over, and whoever it was has now gone into my bedroom. His delicate, pale face turned absolutely white, and for some minutes he hardly knew what to think or do. Then he realised intuitively the delay only set a premium upon fear, and he crossed the landing boldly and went straight into the other room, where, a few seconds before, the steps had disappeared. "'Who's there? Is that you, Mrs. Monks?' he called aloud as he went, and heard the first half of his words echo down the empty stairs while the second half fell dead against the curtains in a room that apparently held no other human figure than his own. "'Who's there?' he called again, in a voice unnecessarily loud, and that only just held firm. "'What do you want here?' The curtain swayed very slightly, and as he saw it, his heart felt as if it almost missed a beat. Yet he dashed forward and drew them aside with a rush, a window, streaming with rain, was all that met his gaze. He continued his search, but in vain. The cupboards held nothing but rows of clothes, hanging motionless, and under the bed there was no sign of anyone hiding. He stepped backwards into the middle of the room, and as he did so, something all but tripped him up. Turning with a sudden spring of alarm, he saw, 
the kit bag. Odd, he thought, that's not where I left it. A few moments before, it had surely been on his right, between the bed and the bath. He didn't remember having moved it. It was very curious. What in the world was the matter with everything? Were all his senses gone queer? A terrific gust of wind tore at the windows, dashing the sheet against the glass with the force of a small gunshot, and then fled away howling dismally over the waste of Bloomsbury roofs. A sudden vision of the channel next day rose in his mind and recalled him sharply to realities. There's no one there at any rate, that's quite clear, he exclaimed aloud. Yet at the time he uttered them he knew perfectly well that his words were not true and that he did not believe them himself. He felt exactly as though someone was hiding close about him, watching all his movements, trying to hinder his packing in some way. And two of my senses, he added, keeping up the pretense, have played me the most absurd tricks. The steps I heard and the figure I saw were both entirely imaginary. He went back into the front room, poked the fire into a blaze and sat down before it to think. What impressed him more than anything else was the fact that the kit bag was no longer where he had left it. It had been dragged nearer to the door. What happened afterwards that night happened, of course, to a man already excited by fear and was perceived by a man that had not the full and proper control, therefore, of the senses. Outwardly, Johnson remained calm and master of himself to the end, pretending to the very last that everything he witnessed had a natural explanation and was merely delusions of his tired nerves. But inwardly, in his very heart, he knew all along that someone had been hiding downstairs in the empty suite when he came in, that this person had watched his opportunity and then stealthily made his way up to the bedroom and that all he saw and heard afterwards from the moving of the kit bag to, well, to the other things this story is to tell, were caused directly by the presence of this invisible person. And it was here, just when he most desired to keep his mind and thoughts controlled, that the vivid pictures received day after day upon the mental plates exposed in the courtroom of the Old Bailey came strongly to light and developed themselves in the darkroom of his inner vision. Unpleasant haunting memories have a way of coming to life again, just when the mind least desires them, in the silent watches of the night, on sleepless pillows, during the lonely hours spent by sick and dying beds. And so now, in the same way, Johnson saw nothing but the dreadful face of John Turk, the murderer, lowering at him from every corner of his mental field of vision, the white skin, the evil eyes, and the fringe of black hair low over the forehead, all the pictures of those ten days in court crowded back into his mind unbidden and very vivid. This is all rubbish and nerves, he exclaimed at length, springing with sudden energy from his chair. I shall finish my packing and go to bed. I'm overwrought, overtired. No doubt at this rate I shall hear steps and things all night. But his face was deadly white all the same. He snatched up his field glasses and walked across to the bedroom, humming a music hall song as he went, a trifle too loud to be natural. And the instant he crossed the threshold and stood within the room, something turned cold about his heart, and he felt that every hair upon his head stood up. The kit bag lay close in front of him, several feet nearer to the door than he had left it, and just over its crumpled top, he saw a head and face slowly sinking down out of sight, as though someone were crouching behind it to hide. And at the same moment a sound like a long-drawn sigh was distinctly audible in the still air about him, between the gusts of the storm outside. Johnson had more courage and willpower than the girlish indecision of his face indicated, but at first such a wave of terror came over him that for some seconds he could nothing but stand and stare. A violent trembling ran down his back and legs, and he was conscious of a foolish, almost a hysterical impulse to scream aloud. That sigh seemed in his very ear, and the air still quivered with it. It was unmistakably a human sigh. Who, who's there? he said at length, finding his voice, but though he meant to speak with loud decision, the tones came out instead in a faint whisper for he had partly lost the control of his tongue and lips. 
He stepped forward so that he could see all round and over the kit bag. Of course there was nothing there, nothing but the faded carpet and the bulging canvas sides. He put out his hands and threw open the mouth of the sack where it had fallen over, being only three parts full, and then he saw for the first time that round the inside, some six inches from the top, there ran a broad smear of dull crimson. It was an old and faded bloodstain. He uttered a scream and drew back his hands as if they had been burnt. At the same moment, the kit bag gave a faint but unmistakable lurch forward towards the door. Johnson collapsed backwards, searching with his hands for the support of something solid, and the door, being further behind him than he realized, received his weight just in time to prevent his falling and shut to with a resounding bang. At the same moment, the swinging of his left arm accidentally touched the electric switch and the light in the room went out. It was an awkward and disagreeable predicament, and if Johnson had not been possessed of real pluck, he might have done all manner of foolish things. As it was, however, he pulled himself together and groped furiously for the little brass knob to turn the light on again. But the rapid closing of the door had set the coats hanging on it as swinging, and his fingers became entangled in the confusion of sleeves and pockets, so that it was some moments before he found the switch. And in those few moments of bewilderment and terror, two things happened, sent him beyond recall over the boundary into the region of genuine horror. He distinctly heard the kit bag shuffling heavily across the floor in jerks, and close in front of his face, sounded once again the sigh of a human being. In his anguished efforts to find the brass button on the wall, he nearly scraped the nails from his fingers, but even then, in those frenzied moments of alarm, so swift and alert are the impressions of a man keyed up by vivid emotion, he had time to realize that he dreaded the return of the light and that it might be better for him to stay hidden in the merciful screen of darkness. It was but the impulse of a moment, however, and before he had time to act upon it, he had yielded automatically to the original desire, and the room was flooded again with light. But the second instinct had been right. It would have been better for him to have stayed in the shelter of the kind darkness. For there, close before him, bending over the half-packed kit bag, Clear as life in the merciless glare of the electric light stood the figure of John Turk, the murderer. Not three feet from him the man stood, the fringe of black hair marked plainly against the pallor of the forehead, the whole horrible presentiment of the scoundrel, as vivid as he had seen him day after day in the old bailey when he stood there in the dock, cynical and callous, under the very shadow of the gallows. In a flash, Johnson realized what it all meant, the dirty and much-used bag, the smear of crimson within the top, the dreadful stretched condition of the bulging sides. He remembered how the victim's body had been stuffed into a canvas bag for burial, the ghastly dismembered fragments forced with lime into this very bag. And the bag itself produced as evidence it all came back to him as clear as day. Very softly and stealthily his hand groped behind him for the handle of the door, but before he could actually turn it, the very thing that he most of all dreaded came about, and John Turk lifted his devil's face and looked at him. At the same moment, that heavy sigh passed through the air of the room, formulated somehow into words. It's my bag, and I want it. Johnson just remembered clawing the door open and then falling in a heap upon the floor of the landing as he tried frantically to make his way into the front room. He remained unconscious for a long time, and it was still dark when he opened his eyes and realized that he was lying stiff and bruised on the cold boards. Then the memory of what he had seen rushed back into his mind, and he promptly fainted again. When he woke the second time, the wintry dawn was just beginning to peep in at the windows, painting the stairs a cheerless, dismal grey, and he managed to crawl into the front room and cover himself with an overcoat in the armchair where at length he fell asleep. A great clamour woke him. He recognised Mrs Monks's voice, loud and voluble. What, you ain't been to bed, sir? Are you will, or has anything happened? And there's an urgent gentleman to see you, though it ain't even seven o'clock yet, and... Who is it, he stammered. I'm all right, thanks. Fell asleep in my chair, I suppose. 
someone from Mr. Wilbram's and he says he ought to see you quick before you go abroad. And I told him... Show him up, please, at once, said Johnson, whose head was whirling and his mind was still full of dreadful visions. Mr. Wilbraham's man came in with many apologies and explained briefly and quickly that an absurd mistake had been made and that the wrong kit bag had been sent over the night before. Henry somehow got hold of the one that came over from the courtroom and Mr. Wilbraham had only discovered it when he saw his own lying in the room and asked why it hadn't gone to you, the man said. Oh, said Johnson stupidly. And he must have brought you the one from the murder case instead, so I'm afraid. The man continued without the ghost of an expression on his face. The one John Turk packed the dead bloke in. Mr. Wilbraham's awful upset about it, sir, and told me to come over first thing this morning with the right one as you were leaving by the boat. He pointed to a clean-looking kit bag on the floor, which he had just brought. And I was to bring the other one back, sir, he added casually. For some minutes, Johnson couldn't find his voice. At last, he pointed in the direction of his bedroom. Perhaps you would kindly unpack it for me. Just empty the things out on the floor. The man disappeared into the other room and was gone for five minutes. Johnson heard the shifting to and fro of the bag and the rattle of the skates and boots being unpacked. Thank you, sir, the man said, returning with the bag folded over his arm. Can I do anything more to help you, sir? What is it? asked Johnson, seeing that he still had something he wished to say. The man shuffled and looked mysterious. Big pardon, sir, but knowing your interest in the Turk case... I thought you'd maybe like to know what's happened. Yes. John Turk killed himself last night with poison, immediately on getting his release. And he left a note for Mr. Wilbraham saying, as he'd be much obliged if they'd have him put away, same as the woman he murdered in the old kit bag. What time did he do it? asked Johnson. Ten o'clock last night, the warder says. Green Holly by Elizabeth Bowen. Mr. Rankstock entered the room with a dragging tread. Nobody looked up or took any notice. With a muted groan, he dropped into an armchair, out of which he shot with a sharp yelp. He searched the seat of the chair and extracted something. "'Your holly, I think, Miss Bates,' he said, holding it out to her. Miss Bates took it a second or two to look up from her magazine. "'What?' she said. "'Oh, it must have fallen down from that picture.' Put it back, please. We haven't got very much. I regret, interposed Mr. Winterslow, that we haven't had any. It makes scratchy noises against the walls. It's seasonable, said Miss Bates firmly. You didn't do this to us last Christmas. Last Christmas, she said, I had Christmas leave. This year, there seems to be none with berries. The birds have eaten them. If there were not a draught, the leaves wouldn't scratch the walls. I can't control the forces of nature, can I? How should I know, said Mr. Rankstock, lighting his pipe. These three by now felt that, like Chevalier and his old Dutch, they'd been together for forty years, and to them it did seem a year too much. Actually, their confinement dated from 1940. They were experts in what the censor would not permit me to say. They were accounted for by their friends in London as being somewhere off in the country. Nobody knows where doing something frightfully hush-hush. Nobody knows what. That is, they were accounted for in this manner if there were still anybody who still cared to ask. But on the whole, they had dropped out of human memory. Their reappearances in their former circles were infrequent, ghostly, and unsuccessful. Their friends could hardly disguise their pity, and for their own part, they had not a word to say. They had come to prefer to spend leaves with their families, who at least showed a flattering pleasure in their importance. This Christmas, it so worked out that there was no question of leave for Mr. Rankstock, Mr. Winterslow or Miss Bates, with four others now playing or watching ping-pong in the next room. They composed in their high-grade way a skeleton staff. It may be wondered why, after years of proximity, they should continue to address one another so formally. They did not continue. They had begun again in the matter of appellations, as in that of intimacy. They had by now, in fact, by some time ago, completed the full circle. For some months they could not recall in which year Miss Bates had been engaged to Mr. Winterslow. Before that, she had been extremely friendly with Mr. Rankstock. 
Mr. Rankstock's deviation towards one Carla, now at her ping-pong in the next room, had been totally uninteresting to everybody, including, apparently, himself. If the war lasted, Carla might next year be called Miss Tongue. At present, Miss Bates was foremost in keeping her in her place by going on addressing her by her Christian name. If this felt like their fortieth Christmas in each other's society, it was their first in these particular quarters. You would not have thought, as Mr. Rankstock said, that one country house could be much worse than another, but this had proved, and was still proving, untrue. The army, for reasons it failed to justify, wanted the house they had been in since 1940, so they, lock, stock and barrel and files and all, had been bundled into another one six miles away. Since the move, tentative exploration, for there were none of them walkers, had established that they were now surrounded by rather more mud but fewer trees. What they did know was that their already sufficient distance from the market town, with its bars and movies, had now been added to by six miles. On the other side of their new home, which was called Moxham Grange, there appeared to be nothing, unless, as Miss Bates suggested, swine herds keeping their swine. Mopsum Village contained villagers, evacuees, a church, a public house, on whose never open door was chalked, no beer, no matches, no tea served, and a vicar. The vicar had sent up a nice note, saying he was not clear whether security regulations would allow him to call, and the doctor had been up once to lance one of Carla's boils. Mopsum Grange was neither old nor new. It replaced, unnecessarily, they all felt, a house on this site that had been burned down. It had a gothic porch and gables, the French windows, bow windows, a conservatory, a veranda, a hall which puce and buff tiled and pitch pine panelled rose to a gallery. In fact, every advantage. Jackdaws fidgeted in its many chimneys, for it had till the war stood empty. One had not to ask why. The hot water system made what Carla called rude noises was capricious in its supplies to the only two mahogany-rimmed baths. The electric light ran from a plant in the yard. If the batteries were not kept charged, the light turned brown. The three now sat in the drawing room, on whose walls mirrors and fitments long since removed left traces. There were, however, some pictures. General Montgomery, who had just shed his holly, and some lancer engravings that had been found in an attic. Three bulbs, naked, shed light manfully, and in the grate the coal fire was doing far from badly. Miss Bates rose and stood twiddling the bit of holly. Something, she said, has got to be done about this. Mr. Winterslow and Miss Rankstock, the latter sucking his pipe, sank lower between their shoulder beds in their respective armchairs. Miss Bates, having drawn a breath, took a running jump at a table, which she propelled across the room with a grating sound. Achtung! she shouted at Mr. Rankstock, who, with an oath, withdrew his chair from her route. Having got the table under General Montgomery, Miss Bates, with a display of long, slender leg, clad in ribbed scarlet sports stockings, that was of interest to no one, mounted it, then proceeded to tuck the holly back into position over the General's frame. Meanwhile, Mr. Winterslow, choosing his moment, stealthily reached across her empty chair and possessed himself of her magazine. What a hope! Miss Bates was known to have eyes all the way down her spine. Damn you, Mr. Winterslow, she said. Put that down! Mr. Rankstock, interfere with Mr. Winterslow. Mr. Winterslow has taken my magazine! She ran up and down the table like something in a cage. Mr. Rankstock removed his pipe from his mouth, dropped his head back, gazed up and said, "'Gad, Miss Bates, you look fine.' "'It's a pretty old magazine,' murmured Mr. Winterslow, flicking the pages over. "'Well, you're pretty old,' she said. "'I hope Carla gets you.' "'Oh, I can do better, thank you. I've got a ghost.' This confidence was cut off by Mr. Rankstock's having burst into song, holding his pipe at arm's length, rocking on his bottom in his armchair, he led them. Hey ho, sing hey ho, unto the green holly, most friendship is feigning, most loving mere 
folly. Mere folly. Mere folly, contributed Mr. Winterlow, picking up, joining in. Both sang. Then hey, ho, the holly, this life is most jolly. Now all, said Mr. Rankstock, jerking his pipe at Miss Bates. So all three went through it once more, with degrees of passion. Miss Bates, when others desisted, being left singing, Hey ho, sing, hey ho, sing, all by herself. Next door, the ping pong came to an awestruck stop. At any rate, said Mr. Rankstock, we all like Shakespeare. Miss Bates, whose intelligence like her singing tonight seemed some way off at the tail of the hunt, looked blank, began to get off the table and said, But I thought that was a Christmas carol. The companions shrugged and glanced at each other. Having taken her magazine away from Mr. Winterslow, she was once more settling down to it when she seemed struck. What was that you said about you had got a ghost? Mr. Winterslow looked down his nose. At this early stage, I don't like to say very much. In fact, on the whole, forget it, if you don't mind. Look, Mr. Rankstock said, if you started seeing things. I'm only sorry, his colleague said, that I've spoke. Oh, no, you're not, said Miss Bates. And we better know just what is fishy about this grange. There's nothing fishy, said Mr. Winterslow in a fastidious tone. It was hard indeed to tell from his manner whether he did or did not regret having made a start. He had reddened, but not perhaps wholly painfully. His eyes, now fixed on the fire, were at once bright and vacant. With unheeding, fumbling movements, he got out a cigarette lit it, and dropped the match on the floor to slowly burn one more hole in the fibre mat. Gripping the cigarette between tense lips, he first flung his arms out, as though casting off a cloak, then pressed both hands clasped firmly to the nerve centre in the nape of his neck, as though to contain the sensation there. She was marvellous, he brought out, what I could see of her. Don't talk with a cigarette in your mouth, Miss Bates said. Young, adorably, not so very. At the same time, quite... Oh, well, you know what I mean. Uh-huh, said Miss Bates. And wearing? I'm certain she had a feather boa. You mean, Mr. Rankstock said, that this brushed your face. And when and where did this happen, said Miss Bates, with legal coldness. Cross-examination clearly became more and more repugnant to Mr. Winterslow in his present mood. He shut his eyes, sighed bitterly, heaved himself from his chair and said, Oh, well, and stood indecisively looking towards the door. Don't let us keep you, said Miss Bates. The one thing I don't see is, if you're being fed with beautiful thoughts, why you wanted to keep on taking my magazine. I wanted to be distracted. Huh? There are moments when I don't quite know where I am. You surprise me, said Mr. Rankstock. Good God, man! What is the matter? For Mr. Winterslow, like a man being swooped around by a bat, was revolving, staring from place to place, high up round the walls of the gaunt lit room. Miss Bates observed, Well, now we have started something. Mr. Rankstock, considerably kinder, said, that is only Miss Bates' holly flittering in the wind. Mr. Winterslow gulped. He walked to the inch of the mirror propped on the mantelpiece and, as nonchalantly as possible, straightened his tie. Having done this, he said, But there isn't a wind tonight. The ghost hesitated in the familiar corridor. Her visibleness, even on Christmas Eve, was not under her own control. And now she had fallen in love again, their dependence upon it began to dissolve in patches. This was a concentration of every feeling of the woman prepared to sail downstairs en grand tenue. Flamboyance and agitation were both present. But between these, and because of her years of death, their cut and extreme anxiety, it was not merely a matter of how was she, but of was she tonight at all. Death had left her to be her own mirror, for into no other was she able to see. 
For tonight she had discarded the feather boa. It had been dropped into the limbo that was her wardrobe now. Her shoulders she knew were bare. Round their bareness shimmered a thousand evenings. Her own person haunted her. Above her forehead the crisp springy weight of her pompadour. Round her feet the frou-frou of her skirts on the thick carpet. In her nostrils the scent from her corsage. Up and down her forearm the glittery slipping of bracelets warmed by her own blood. It is the haunted who haunt. There were lights in the house again. She heard laughter, and then there had been singing. From those few dim lights and untrue notes, her senses, after their starvation, set going the whole grand opera again. She smiled and moved down the corridor to the gallery where she stood looking down into the hall. The tiles of the hall floor were as pretty as ever, as cold as ever, and bore, as always on Christmas Eve, the trickling pattern of dark blood. The figure of the man with the side of his head blown out lay there, as always, one foot just touching the lowest step of the stairs. It was too bad. She had been silly, but it couldn't be helped. They shouldn't have shut her up in the country. How could she not make hay while the sun shone? The year round, no man except her husband, his uninteresting jealousy, his dull passion. Then at Christmas, so many men that one didn't know where to turn. The ghost, leaning further over the gallery, pouted down at the suicide. She said, You should have let me explain. The man made no answer. He never had. Behind a door somewhere downstairs, a racket was going on. The house sounded funny. There were no carpets. The morning room door was flung open and four flushed people headed by a young woman charged out. They clattered across the man in a trickling pattern as though there were nothing there but the tiles. In the morning room she saw one small white ball trembling to stillness upon the floor. As the people rushed the stairs and fought for place in the gallery the ghost drew back. A purest act of repugnance for this was not necessary. The young woman, to one of whose temples was strapped a cotton wool pad, held her place and disappeared round a corner, exulting, My bath, my bath. Then may you freeze in it, Carla returned the scrawniest of the defeated ones. The words pierced the ghost, who trembled. They did not know. Who were they? She didn't ask. She didn't care. She never had been inquisitive. Information had bored her. Her schooled lips had framed one set of questions, her eyes a consuming other. Now the mills of death with their catching wheels had stripped her of semblance, cast her forth on an everlasting holiday from pretense. She was left with, nay, had to become, her obsession. Thus it is to be a ghost. The ghost fixed her eyes on the other, the drawing-room door, he had gone in there. He would have to come out again. The handle turned, the door opened. Winterslow came out. He shut the door behind him with the sedulous slowness of an uncertain man. He had been humming, and now, squaring his shoulders, began to sing, Mere folly, mere folly. As he crossed the hall towards the foot of the staircase, obstinately never raising his eyes, so it is you, breathed the ghost, with unheard softness. She gathered about her, with a gesture not less proud for being tormentedly uncertain, the total of her visibility. Was it possible diamonds should not glitter now on her rising and falling breast, and swept from the gallery to the head of the stairs? Winterslow shivered violently and looked up. He licked his lips. He said, This cannot go on. The ghost's eyes, with tender impartiality and mockery, from above swept Winterslow's face, the hair receding, the furrowed forehead, the tired sag of the jowl, the strain reddened eyelids, the blue shaved chin. Nothing was lost on her, nothing broke the spell. 
With untroubled wonder she saw his hand-woven tie, his coat pockets shapeless as saddlebags, the bulging knees of his flannel trousers. Wonder went up in rhapsody, so much chaff in the fire. She never had had illusions. The illusion was all. Lovers cannot be choosers. He'd do. He would have to do. I know, she agreed with rapture, casting her hands together. We're mad, you and I. And what's going to happen? I entreat you to leave this house tonight. Winterslow, in a dank, unresounding voice, said, And anyhow, what made you pick me? It's kismet, wailed the ghost zestfully. Why did you have to come here? Why you? I have been so peaceful, just like a little girl. People spoke of love, but I never knew what they meant. Oh, I wish we had never met you and I. Winterslow said, I've been here for three months. We have all of us been here, as a matter of fact. Why all of this all of a sudden? She said, there's a Christmas Eve party, isn't there, going on? One Christmas Eve party, there was a terrible accident. Oh, comfort me. No one has understood. Don't stand there. I can't bear it, just not there. Winterslow, whether he heard or not, cast a scared glance down at his feet, which were in slippers, then shifted a pace or two to the left. Let me up, he said wildly. I tell you, I want my spectacles. I just want to get my spectacles. Let me by. Let you up, the ghost marvelled. But I'm only waiting. She was more than waiting. She set up a sort of suction an icy, indrawing draught. Nor was this wholly psychic, for an isolated holly leaf of Miss Bates's dropped at the turn of the staircase, twitched. And not, you could think, by chance did the electric light choose this moment for one of its brown fade-outs. Gradually, the scene, the hall, the stair, and the gallery faded under this fog-dark but glass-clear veil of hallucination. The feet of Winterslow under remote control began with knocking unsureness to mount the stairs. At their turn he staggered, steadied himself, and then stamped derisively upon the holly leaf. Bah! he neighed. Spectacles! By the ghost now putting out everything, not a word would be dared. Where are you? Weakly, her dress rustled three steps down. The rings on her hand knocked weakly over the panelling. Here! Oh, here! she sobbed. Where I was before! Hell! said Miss Bates, who had opened the drawing room door and was looking resentfully round the hall. This electric light! Mr. Rankstock from inside the drawing room said, Find the man! The man has gone to the village, Mr. Rankstock. If you were half a man! Mr. Winterslow, what are you doing kneeling down on the stairs? Have you come over funny? Really, this is the end. At the other side of a bay's door, one of the installations began ringing. Mr. Rankstock, Miss Bates yelled implacably, yours this time. Mr. Rankstock, with an expression of hatred, whipped out a pencil and pad and shambled across the hall. Under cover of this, Mr. Winterslow pushed himself upright brushed his knees and began to descend the stairs to confront his colleague's narrow but not unkind look. Weeks of exile from any hairdresser had driven Miss Bates to the Alice in Wonderland style. A snood, tied at the top, was now thrust back, adding inches to her pale, polished brow. Nicotine stained the fingers she closed upon Mr. Winterslow's elbow, propelling him back to the drawing room. There's always drink, she said. Come along. He said hopelessly, if you mean the bottle between the filing cabinets, uh, I finished that when I had to work last night. Look here, Miss Bates. Why should she have picked on me? It has been broken off then, said Miss Bates. I'm sorry for you, but I don't like your tone. I resent your attitude to my sex. For that matter, why did you pick on her? Romantic, nostalgic, blue Danube fixated, huh? There's Carla. An understanding girl, unselfish, getting over her boils. There are Avis and Lettuce, due back on Boxing Day. There's me, as you have ceased to observe. 
But, oh dear no, we do not trail feather boas. She only wore that in the afternoon. Now let me tell you something, said Miss Bates. When I opened the door just now to have a look at the lights, what do you think I first saw there in the hall? Uh, uh, me, replied Mr. Winterslow with returning assurance. Oh no. Oh indeed no, said Miss Bates. You? Why should I think twice of that if you were striking attitudes on the stairs? You? No. I saw your enchanting inverse. Extended, as it is true, stone dead. I saw the man of my dreams. From his attitude it was clear he had died for love. There were three pearl studs in his boiled shirt, and his white tie must have been tied in heaven. And the hand that dropped the pistol had dropped a white rose. It lay beside him, brown and crushed from having been often kissed. The ideality of those kisses for the last of which I arrived too late. Here Miss Bates beat her fist against the bow of her snood. Will haunt and by haunting satisfy me? The destruction of his features before I saw them made their former perfection certain where I am concerned, and here I am, left, 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 to watch dust gather on Mr. Rankstock and you. To watch, yes, I who saw in a flash the ink-black perfection of his tailoring, mildew form on those clothes that you never change. To remember how both of you had in common that way of blowing your noses before you kissed me. He had been deceived, hence the shot, hence the fall. But who was she, your feathered friend, to deceive him? Who could have deceived him more superbly than I? I could be fatal, moaned Miss Bates, pacing the drawing-room. I could be fatal. Only give me a break. Well, well, I'm sorry, said Mr. Winterslow, but really, what can I do? Or poor Rangstock do? We're just ourselves. You put the thing in a nutshell, said Miss Bates. Perhaps I could bear it if you just got your hairs cut. If it comes to that, Miss Bates, you might get your set. Mr. Rankstock's re-entry into the drawing room, this time with brisker step for a nice little lot of new trouble was brewing up, synchronized with the fall of the piece of holly again from the general's frame to the Rankstock chair. This time he saw it in time. Your holly, I think, Miss Bates, he said, holding it out to her. We must put it back, said Miss Bates. We haven't got very much. I cannot see, said Mr. Winterslow, why we should have any... I don't see the point of holly without berries. Uh, the birds have eaten them, said Miss Bates. I cannot control the forces of nature, can I? Then hey ho, sing hey ho, Mr. Rankstock led off. Yes, she said. Let us have that pretty carol again. A Fall of Snow by James Turner It happens every year about Christmas time. I have only to go into a shop to buy my Christmas cards and there is bound to be one of boys tobogganing in deep snow. Rather old-fashioned, I suppose, though whether there are fashions in snowfalls, I don't know. Nevertheless, to me, these cards bring it all back. There's generally a farmhouse in the background. An open gate with a robin in his crimson winter coat, great swags of snow on the hedgerows. In the centre of the picture, these two boys are flying downhill, waving their hands, their faces like red apples. Of course, it is an idealised, sort of Dickensian picture. For one thing, I'm certain, the boys careering downhill in the picture would never have had the time to wave. They would have been clinging too tightly to the toboggan. Further, it is an ideal Christmas picture, at least for my part of the country, Cornwall, where we rarely get enough snow to make a snowman, let alone toboggan. There had only been one year since I've lived in Cornwall when the snow was so thick that I was able actually to go onto the beach in the bay near my home and make a snowball and throw it into the sea. It was 1963, that very bad winter, and what I did must, I feel, be some sort of record. So that these kind of Christmassy pictures are pleasant enough to send to a friend, but scarcely real. 
Yet what I remember when I see such a card is that it did once happen to me. It did once become very real indeed. And the two boys in that faraway real picture are David, my cousin, and myself. Of course, it's not so much the picture of two boys tobogganing that causes me even today to shiver slightly. It is the nature of fear itself. For fear is a very odd thing. I mean that now, today, when I'm so much older, I'm not in the least afraid of snow. It's merely a nuisance that has to be cleared away from the front door. It means cold weather, which I can't abide. Yet I'm still afraid of what happened so long ago, in that snowfall in East Anglia. But then, that Christmas of 1922, when my uncle invited me to spend the holiday at his home near Orford in Suffolk, snow was very much a novelty to me. It's difficult to explain exactly. Most childhood fears are when you look back at them from middle age. But when I remember that fear each year, I can only explain it by saying that something was waiting for me behind the snowstorm. Was it, I have often wondered, because I was 15 and young for my age? Was it because snow was so great a novelty to me? Whereas to David, who lived all the year in East Anglia, and therefore knew the land well, as well as being used to snow, nothing happened. It really began when I arrived at my uncle's house. I had gone straight from school instead of going back to Cornwall, since my parents had gone to New York on business. It seemed odd at first to be going to Liverpool Street Station rather than to Paddington. When I left Sussex, the sun was shining, but the sky gradually clouded over, and by the time I had crossed London and the train left Liverpool Street, a light fall of snow covered the station roof. I was thrilled. If snow did come in any quantity, this was going to be a Christmas to remember. My uncle's car was waiting for me at Ipswich. I felt very grand being whisked through the town and into the lanes through Woodbridge and past the lonely farmhouses towards Orford. Although this was Christmas week, no one else but me and the chauffeur seemed to be about in that desolate landscape until we passed the old and secret wood of Staverton, where St Edmund is reputed to have been martyred by the Danes. Then a couple, a man and a woman, emerged from beneath those gnarled and twisted oak and holly trees great bunches of red berries in their arms. It was a further sign of a good Christmas. As the car sped on, I looked back. They were walking in the centre of the road after us. I had the uncanny feeling in the warmth of the car that neither of them was real. And then they were gone in the turn of the road. So far, however, no snow had fallen here. But the lights from the house... Every window seemed to be illuminated, fell on the gravel drive. The lawns were glittering with frost. My aunt, however, knew what was coming. She welcomed me into the hall, beside the stuffed bear with uplifted arms and paws, on which lay a silver tray for visiting cards. Her first words gave me hope. Nicky, dear, it's lovely to see you. David will be pleased. And I really believe we shall have snow for Christmas Day. You've brought it with you. How clever you are. Now you must come at once and get really warm. You must be frozen. I hardly remembered my uncle's house. It's true I had been in it once before, but that was in summer. Then, of course, I had run all over the farms helping, as I thought, the animals. I'd gone off with David often enough to the sea at Orford and Bordsey, and I knew of the merman who had, years ago, come out of the sea and stayed a while at Orford itself. He had been rather a pet with the inhabitants, until, one night, he had slipped away again across the marshes to the shore. It was said that the fact that the local vicar made him go to church, and that he could not bear the long sermons he was forced to listen to any longer, decided him to leave. From my own experience of church, I didn't blame him. David and I had also explored the old castle keep and the numerous martello towers along the coast. What I did remember, however, was that the farmhouse was a tall and impressive Queen Anne house, that it had many rooms from the huge drawing room, the study, the dining room, to the bedrooms and attics, the maid servants. You have to remember that this was in the old-fashioned days of 1922, when servants were still kept, lived in these attics, and went down the back stairs to the kitchen and sculleries, pantries and dairies. The first time I had been ten years old, 
Even so, I was conscious of the warmth and comfort of real wealth, even if farming was in a bad state, especially in East Anglia, though it was to get even worse later. The point was that my uncle did not depend on his farms for his income. That came from his business enterprises. I didn't know then what they were. Uh, truth to tell, I didn't care. All I knew was that it, Scarlet's it was called, with its endless acres, its workmen and farmers, was to me a wonderful playground. And that David was a wonderful companion, making up new adventures each day and telling the most absurd lies each night as we lay in bed in his bedroom on the first floor, overlooking the woods back into the heart of Suffolk. This evening, Four nights before Christmas 1922, what I remembered of the house was quite changed. The interior was alight with welcome. Whatever was to happen outside, in the house, there was safety and gaiety. The staircase was festooned with branches of green holly and ivy. Paper chains and Chinese lanterns alternated with bunches of mistletoe, and the sideboard groaned under the weight of fruit and nuts. Furthermore, the house seemed full of servants. It didn't take much intelligence to sense all the other good things, plum puddings, mince pies, York hams that Mrs. Horsley, the cook, had up her sleeve for Christmas Day itself. While I was warming myself before the huge log fire in the drawing room, my uncle came in. He was a short man, thick-set, rather Dickensian. He was smoking a cigar, and his first remark was what I should have expected of him. He always spoke in a ponderous manner weighing his words as if everything he said was of the utmost importance. Now, of course, when I look back at him, it's easy to see him at the head of a boardroom table or deciding the fate of the companies under his command. But then he was a person I should not have cared to cross. After I had stood up and thanked him for asking me to come to stay, he shook hands with me in a formal manner and went on. I regret, Nicholas, he would never have dreamed of calling me Nicky, I regret very much the holly this year has few, I might almost say, no berries. And Christmas, you'll agree, depends largely for its full effect on red holly berries. Actually, I would have thought, and did even then, that it was brandy which really made Christmas for him. Neither did I dare to tell him that I had seen two people emerge from Staverton Forest so near his property with buried holly in their hands. He might have sacked one of his employees for not knowing the right place to go. And snow, uncle, I exclaimed, catching sight of my cousin David coming down the stairs. It was snowing a little in London. Surely it'll come this way soon. Your aunt, my uncle said, who knows all about winds and weather, seems to think it will. She's making preparations for it too. And with that, he walked out of the room and no doubt, thinking that he had done all that could be expected of him towards a nephew of fifteen shut himself in his study. I suppose it was just after eleven that we went to bed that first night. I was to sleep in David's room. We were hardly undressed when he said excitedly, You on, Nick? I had no idea what he was talking about, but I was not going to show myself a coward in front of him. Uh, y yes, of course. But what do you mean? You haven't been here at a Christmas before, have you? Well, we're going to raid the servants, the young ones at least. He was laughing and rolling up one long football, stocking into a ball and thrusting it into the foot of another, making a fairly soft, primitive club. But you might hurt someone with that, I said. Nonsense, Nick. He threw the club across the bed to me. He'll only give them a fright. Couldn't hurt them. He smiled in what I thought was a rather nasty manner and brought his wadded stocking down with a thump on the bed. We do this every year, he went on. What's more, they'll be expecting us, and there's generally some chap from school staying. None of them could come this year, though. I felt his contempt for me as a substitute. He banged the waddy, as he called it, down on the bed again. He laughed once more. We'll have to be careful we don't get hurt ourselves. Although it seemed silly to me, I followed him onto the dark landing. He flashed the torch, ran up the attic stairs silently, and stood outside the second door on the right of the corridor. We don't have to worry about old Horsley, the cook. She's snoring her head off at the end of the corridor, Anyway, she never wakes up. He turned to me and whispered. We burst in and run straight across the room, lashing out with our waddies and then out again, like a whirlwind. Don't waste any time once we're inside. I stood shivering outside the door in pyjamas and dressing gown, excited at the adventure and wrought up by David's mood. 
As he burst open the door, the light went on. Far from us, just running across the room, delivering a few well-aimed blows and out again, we were taken entirely by surprise. The maids were waiting for us, but so great was our impetus that we were amongst the three of them before we could stop. The noise of laughter and David's war whoops must have been terrific. I felt my club wrenched from my hand. I was tripped and fell across the bed. The light suddenly went out and I felt myself firmly held down. I had no idea what happened to David or what was to happen to me. All I now really remember, because it was the first time it had happened to me, was that when the lights went on again, Helen, one of the housemaids, was holding me down and laughing at me. I was vaguely aware of my uncle shouting at us from below to be quiet. I tried to get up from Helen's bed, but I was too firmly held. Indeed, this was David's error of tactics. He forgot that all the maids had to do was to get hold of our arms and we would be helpless to wield our weapons. Oh no, Master Nicholas, Helen was saying as I heard my uncle roar again. You've lost the battle and you'll have to pay. Like this. I felt her hot lips on mine. She kissed me three times before she released me. Sweet, gentle kisses. Now go, she said, taking away the lovely warmth of her arms. And happy Christmas to you. I remember I ran out of their bedroom, between the other two beds, with all of them laughing, my face burning. The whole episode. It shows you the kind of escapade that David got up to. It had hardly taken more than ten minutes. Nevertheless, even now, I cannot forget Helen's face that night and the warmth of her kisses. Perhaps I would have forgotten if the snow had not come. And while we were asleep, it did come. No one heard it. No one was kept awake by its coming. But when I looked out of the bedroom window before dressing to go down for breakfast, there it was. The miracle which had begun at Liverpool Street Station was now clear to us all. I was caught up in the wonder of it and hardly heard David call out, Hurry up, Nick, and get dressed. Father's driving us over to Orlick's farm to get the turkey, and I bet we'll be able to toboggan. It's colossally thick. I did dress quickly. No doubt the smell of bacon and eggs coming up from the dining room would have hurried me anyway. I sat down between David and my aunt, and Helen brought me a plate of beautiful breakfast. She was smiling at me, as if we shared a secret. I suppose in a rather schoolboy manner. I had fallen in love with her. The snow was still a wonder when we got into the car, the very suddenness of its coming, as it were, over the fields and woods behind the house, the amazing difference its coming made to everything, the joy of living inside a house and being able to run out into a world of icing sugar made its arrival the supreme Christmas present. To me, this landscape of gleaming white increased the mysteriousness of the countryside. It did more, now that I was actually out in it. It frightened me. For it was while my uncle was interviewing Andrews, his tenant at Orlick's farm, and examining the fallen roof of one of the barns, that David and I first got out into this whiteness. I was suddenly lost. I see that now that this vast expanse of white had torn away the edges of my familiar world. Where before I knew my way about, now everything, the fields, the trees, the church, even the cottages on my uncle's estate, was strange and terrifying. Every landmark changed. David had, of course, already formed one of his mad schemes. The snow didn't frighten him. He saw nothing at all strange in it. Only a phenomenon laid on for his special benefit. Only a natural event against which to pit his strength. He had the idea of pulling out into the untrodden snow the top half of the pigsty door and converting it into a toboggan. I went to help him lift it to where the field began to slope downwards to the valley below. Nothing could have made me tell him of my fears. In fact, I was rather proud that he considered me capable of helping him. The battle we had lost the night before was never mentioned. Y you sit in front, Nick, he said, throwing himself in a professional manner, full length at the back. I'll steer. I'm an expert at it. Even as I did what he told me, I recalled how last night, as we stood outside the maid's door, his confidence had led him into error. Our craft, imbued all at once with a life of its own, sprang across the snow silently and with gathering speed. For one crazy moment it turned and twisted like a top, until, either under its own weight or David's feet, it righted its course. We shot downhill at what seemed to me a terrific speed. We were alone, 
cruising on a white sea, a vast opalescent ocean, with land before us in the shape of a gate opening between two ends of a hedge. Cold air was tearing into my lungs. My whole body was ecstatic with the cold and the fright of speed. I frantically grasped the iron ring used to open the door when it was in place. In a mad dream of pleasure and terror, I heard David's voice giving the command, as it were, from the bridge. I'm going to steer through the gate. Don't move. Hold on and keep your feet in. The sun, low over the approaching hedge, was burning with one great eye at me. The frail craft that we were adrift upon tore across the snow and, with an immense surge of power, drilled its way through the hedge opening, through the massive banks of hedge snow, shooting up the far hill, came to a stop. It was then that I felt the pain in my leg and the terror in my mind. Of the two, the terror was the worst. I bit back a cry. David was already off the wooden door and preparing to drag it back up the hill for a second ride. He looked at me where I was still lying in the snow. Hey, he said contemptuously, get up, Nick. Help me pull this thing to the top again. I'll show you something even better. I was astonished that he could be so calm that he made no reference to what I had seen, for surely he must have seen it too. I, I can't, David, I said. I'm afraid I can't. It, it's my leg. Something happened when we shot through the gate. For one brief moment, I saw the look of anger on his face, and then either from the sight of so much blood on the snow or because of the sharpness of the pain, I fainted. I gather, because David told me afterwards that I called out to him, get help for Helen, she's by the gate. I don't remember being taken back to my uncle's house. David told me that they, my uncle and Andrews from the farm, carried me to the car. And it turned out that I hadn't broken my leg after all. There must have been an iron spike on the gate concealed by the snow and it had ripped a long, deep wound in my calf as we shot through. It bled profusely. My aunt's doctor came and put in twelve stitches. But when I woke in bed in one of the guest rooms, not in David's, warm and protective, it was not the accident to my leg which worried me. It was what had happened to Helen. She was lying against the hedge as we rushed through, a widening pool of blood issuing from her head and matting her hair. Her eyes were staring as if she were appealing to me for help. She was wearing a thin summer dress. In the short time I saw her, I was not only horrified by her accident, but also by the fact that she was out in this cold weather with no coat on. She must have been walking across the field, though why? when she would have had more than her share of work back at the house with everyone so busy, and slipped in some way and hit her head on the same iron projection which had ripped open the calf of my leg. She, like me, would have fainted from loss of blood. But now, here, in bed, I knew with a certainty I could not deny that Helen was dead, that help did not come in time to save her. I had expected something horrible to happen. I was convinced that this miracle of snow, which had so excited me when I could look at it from the house or the car, was malevolent. The unnaturalness of it, to one who was not used to it, was frightening. It, the snow, did not want me out in it. I was uneasy the moment I went into it with David. Unlike him, I was not master of every situation, nor was I able, as he was, to create situations which I could command. He would never have felt that something was hidden in this all-obscuring white blanket, suffocating, waiting to rush out at him in the same way that an open door at the head of a dark staircase may conceal something ready to spring out at your approach. I can explain it in no other way, but from the second the toboggan began to rush downhill, I saw the features of this threat rushing up to meet me as I was rushing to meet it, and then there was no stopping, and indeed I had been right, for here I lay in bed, when I should have been enjoying the final preparations for Christmas, and Helen was dead. I was, too, acutely embarrassed at being such a nuisance. I almost wept at the thought that by my ineffectiveness, or stupidity as David would have called it, I was spoiling Christmas for everyone else. I didn't know that my aunt paid me several visits before I came out of the anaesthetic, but she was beside me when I did. Is it very painful, Nicky dear, she asked. Because if so, the doctor says that you can have a pill to ease it. No, Aunt Amy, 
I was propped up on pillows, and I dare say I looked white and wan. I put out my hand and touched hers, as if, by so doing, I could grasp her protection. For this was the whole point of what had happened. The pain in my leg did not matter. I wasn't going to let her think that I couldn't stand it. But please, I asked, did they get to Helen in time? Was she still alive? My aunt smiled. She must have thought that I was still wandering under the effects of the anaesthetic. Helen, dear? There's nothing wrong with Helen. At least I hope not. We depend on her a great deal at a time like this. She's a good girl. But she was there in the snow. I saw her. She'd had an accident. She'd hit her head. Where, dear? By the gate. Just as we rushed through. It was horrible. She was lying there in a pool of blood. Did Uncle manage to save her? I suppose what I was saying must have sounded melodramatic to my aunt. She smiled again and pulled the sheets up to my chin. Nicky, you're not to worry about such things. You've been dreaming. A nasty dream, I agree. But when one hurts oneself and loses a lot of blood as you have, and then had an anaesthetic, you do have funny dreams. She got up from the bed. All you have to do is get strong again so that we can have you with us on Christmas Day. But aunt, I did see her. I did. And she was hurt. Well, we can soon prove it was all a dream, my dear. Besides, weren't you and David up in the maid's room last night? You made a great deal of noise, and I'm not sure that I approve of it at all. I suddenly remembered how Helen had held me then. The warmth of her arms. Now she was dead. I couldn't hold back my tears. It was obvious that my aunt thought me too weak to be told the truth. I'll send her up with a cup of cocoa, she said. That'll do you good, you see. As she shut the door, I don't think I expected to see Helen come in, a kind of resuscitated corpse. In my still fuddled state, I thought my aunt too was playing a macabre joke on me. It must have been ten minutes later that I heard the knock on the bedroom door. I shrank back into the bedclothes with fear. Helen came in carrying a tray. I must have stared at her in my fright. Master and Nicholas, she laughed. Whatever's the matter? You look as if you'd seen a ghost. She put the tray down beside my bed as I gasped out. Is it really you, Helen? Of course it is, Master Nicholas. Here, take my hand. You'll soon find out. I did take her hand. It was warm and strong. She was laughing as she had laughed the night before. There, she said. I'm flesh and blood, aren't I? But, but, I stammered out, realising that what my aunt had said was true. It was all a dream. I had not seen Helen in the snow, covered with blood, dead. She was very much alive. But nothing, she said. You hurry up and get that leg well again, or Christmas will be spoiled. And hey, let go my hand. I've work to do, you know. Can't lie about in bed all day like some I know. Helen, I asked. Helen, it was last night David and I played that silly joke, wasn't it? It was very silly too, since we knew all about it and expected you. And you did kiss me, didn't you? Three times. Well, Master Nicholas, that was all a bit of fun really, wasn't it? I noticed that she was blushing. Then I begged, leaning towards her. Kiss me once again. It's important to me. She patted my hand gently. Whatever next, she laughed. Just suppose your aunt was to come in while we're at it. She won't, I said, and even if she did, I think she'd understand. Well, she laughed again, knowing nothing of my reasons for asking her to kiss me. If it'll make you better quickly, then, here... She leaned over and kissed me as warmly as she had the night before. When she had gone, I closed my eyes. So, after all, it was only hallucination. What still worried me, however, was the strangeness of the occurrence and why I should have dreamed that I saw something in the snow that wasn't there, the semblance of Helen, dead. Because my life up to then had been completely normal. I was a normal boy who often trembled in mock fear of the supernatural, because for all my aunt said, for all Helen's kiss, I was not deceived. I knew that I had seen her in the snow as the iron cut into my leg. Like any other boy, I expected ghost stories at Christmas. That was the time for them. What I had not expected, and now feared, was that such things should actually become real could come out of some secret place and threaten every thread of normal life. I was convinced, as I sipped the cocoa Helen had brought me, 
but for a moment in the snow out there I had touched the rim of another hidden world which had nothing to do with such things as school life, holidays, friendship. I was beginning to see in a very immature way that there were other realities beneath the life I lived so unthinkingly. I hardly heard my aunt say when she came to visit me again, You know what, Nicky? The snow isn't going to last long. I'm so sorry the wind has changed back to the south. Far from missing any festivities, I became what my uncle in his ponderous way called the centre of interest. He even went so far as to suggest that I was a bit of a hero and David himself was almost, but not quite, put in the shade. As I fell asleep the night before, when my aunt left me with her weather predictions, the house was full of noise. I heard my uncle go to the front door and invite inside the company of waits who were doing their best with Noel. David told me that his father had brewed a special bowl of punch for them. Two female cousins had arrived, and already a dance for New Year's Eve was being talked about. In the excitement of presents, the Christmas tree, the huge turkey which my uncle carved with so much skill, I forgot what had happened two days ago, when Helen and the other maids were ushered in by Mrs. Horsley to drink the health of the company. I no longer worried about what I had thought I had seen. Time, as always on Christmas Day when I was young, passed so swiftly that I hardly noticed it. Almost before I realised it, my aunt was ordering me back to bed. My uncle and David carried me upstairs. I fell asleep at once. It shows what a normal kind of boy I was, for it never occurred to me that I should have any further bad dreams. When I woke, I lay for some minutes listening. Something was beating against the window pane. I was conscious, too, that something was missing, and yet, at the same time, I was filled with an amazing, overwhelming happiness. I looked at the chest of drawers where the presents I had been given were spread out like a shop window. But the explanation of my happiness was not there. It was some greater miracle. I got up and, with great care, put my injured leg to the floor. I could walk haltingly, clutching the edge of the table. I drew myself to the window. I caught my breath at the sight which met my eyes, for magically it seemed the snow had disappeared and the noise I had heard was rain. A warm wind was blowing, everything, the stables, the church, the chimney pots of the cottages, the trees themselves were clearly outlined under the dawn light. My aunt had been right. As if someone had pulled off a white dust sheet from a room full of furniture, the countryside again visible. Now there was nowhere for anything to lurk, no spot so obscured by snow that it could hold a threat. Once again, the world was familiar and safe. I pulled open the window and leaned out into the warm rain, which you sometimes get in late December. I watched a curl of smoke rise from a cottage chimney. Someone had lighted a fire. Christmas, when nothing really bad could happen, had even defeated the snow itself. By the middle of January, I was back in Cornwall. I spent the next two Christmases with my parents who had returned from the States. In fact, one Christmas day, it was so warm that I bathed in Trayanian Bay just below our house. I hardly remembered the contrast from the Christmas of 1922. Now, it was the summer term of 1924. I was beginning to enjoy school and had recently been made a prefect. Probably, as I was 17 and already thinking of following David to Oxford, not before time. I think it was a Thursday, in the middle of July, when Thompson, the head of my house and a great friend, called out to me as we passed in the long study corridor. See, your uncle's got his name in the telegraph. What do you mean? Well, he laughed and walked on. Seems he's been killing off his maids. I ran to the papers, which were always laid out on the table in the common room. There it was, on the front page. I recognised the picture at once. I had seen it before, though then snow covered that particular field. And although the photograph did not show much of her face, I knew at once that it was Helen. I recognised the summer dress she was wearing as she lay beside the gate. In death, she was that small, woebegone figure I had seen in the snow over two years ago. The body of Helen Simpson, I read unable to repress my shivering, holding on to the table tightly, 
so vivid were the pictures of what I had once seen in the snow. A maidservant in the household of Sir Thomas May, the financier, was found at about eleven o'clock yesterday morning beside a gate at Orlick's farm, owned by Sir Thomas, by his tenant, Mr. James Andrews. A farmhand assumed to be her lover has been arrested and charged with her murder. The police are anxious to interview a boy of about fifteen who Mr. Andrews says ran off as he approached the body of the girl. Christmas by John Betjeman The bells of waiting advent ring The tortoise stove is lit again The lamp oil light across the night Has caught the streaks of winter rain In many a stained glass window sheen From crimson lake to hooker's green The holly in the windy hedge And round the manor house the yew will soon be stripped to deck the ledge, the altar, font, and arch, and pew, so that the villagers can say, the church looks nice on Christmas Day. Provincial public houses blaze and corporation tramcars clang on lighted tenements I gaze, where paper decorations hang, and bunting in the red town hall says Merry Christmas to you all. And London shops on Christmas Eve are strung with silver bells and flowers as hurrying clerks the city leave to pigeon-haunted classic towers and marbled clouds go scudding by the many-steepled London sky and girls in slacks remember dad and oafish louts remember mum and sleepless children's hearts are glad and Christmas morning bells say come even to shining ones who dwell safe in the Dorchester Hotel. And is it true, and is it true, this most tremendous tale of all, seen in a stained glass window's hue, a baby in an ox's stall, the maker of the stars and sea, become a child on earth for me? And is it true, or if it is, no loving fingers tying strings around those tissued fripperies, the sweet and silly Christmas things, bath salts and inexpensive scent, and hideous tie so kindly meant. No love that in a family dwells, no caroling in frosty air, nor all the steeple-shaking bells can with this single truth compare, that God was man in Palestine, and lives today in bread and wine. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some dies. Come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? Back, you tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How to do the dead come back, Mother? You? You What's the secret of the dead come back? Mother? 